Hello folks, I'm starting my streaming a little bit early tonight um, because I'm half expecting some problems with the stream as I've reset the uh, stream code. Um, those of you who've used OBS software with uh, YouTube live streaming will understand um, will understand the problem. I can't see any streamers yet, but then there's a 30 second latency time. I may have to completely reset all of this. And I can't see any stream yet. Um, oh, it looks like we've got one. And there we are. Um, that's good. Okay, tonight a series of uh, videos, some taken by myself um, on Thursday with Peter VK3ACZ, who's one of our regulars on the Saturday sessions, um, in voice. This time you'll see him in the flesh with his wife Sandra. Hello to both of them. Um, but first a couple of little novelty items which I'll throw in after 9.30 when it ticks over. It's now 9.28. When I uh, connect at 9.30 it'll be on the 2 metre radio behind me. Um, just checking for lost frames. It looks like all of my setup's been successful. Um, this is Chris VK3 Alpha Mike Lima from Burwood East in Melbourne, about 20 kilometres due east of the city of Melbourne for those who aren't familiar with Australian um, geography. I'll just turn that down a little bit. And uh, every Saturday night we have these sessions of pertaining in some way to ham radio science and technology or broadcasting. Uh, and I know that a lot of people looking in have had experience of one or other or perhaps even all three in some cases. Um, in particular note this week uh, with Peter VK3ACZ we spent an afternoon in the Dandenong Ranges in a locale near South Belgrave, Belgrave Heights, which uh, we're not going to be too uh, eager to publicise the exact location but it's a very quiet radio location, very free of electrical noise. And uh, Peter's found it by experiment over uh, several tries in several locations. And it's not an area that uh, receives an awful lot of visitors, as does Mount Dandenong or One Tree Hill. So one can do one's experiments, one's transmissions uh, in relative peace without people saying, oh, I can do all of that on my mobile phone. <laughs> and I'm sure there are a lot of ham radio operators out there who've experienced that. Anyway, it's now 9.30, we'll go on the air. Hello, this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima with the regular Saturday night test transmission with um, documentary material intended for ham radio operators and shortwave listeners principally although um, some of the material casts the net a bit wider into science and technology. But this week principally we'll be dealing with HF communications and ionospheric propagation. Uh, and we have some old but very pertinent, still pertinent documentaries on that coming up. But first, uh, an interesting little bit of film um, that will be of particular interest, I know, to... Jeff VK3VJS, Jeff Sylvester, who has an interest in Victorian Police Radio Patrol. A film from 1932, shot by Herschel's Films of Jollymont uh, in the St Kilda area principally. Um, the uh, Herschel's company was involved with the production of a newsreel for about 12 months from 19, end of 1931 to the end of 1932. And this is one of the items shot for that Melbourne Herald newsreel, which was eventually subsumed by the Cine Sound newsreel in Sydney. Uh, it shows in a sound, a talking picture, 
the operation of the Victoria Police Radio Patrol, which was considered to be state-of-the-art in 1932. From about 1923, they'd have been experimenting here in Melbourne with communication between uh, base, initially the maritime station VIM, later the Russell Street headquarters of uh, Victoria Police, to the patrol cars. And initially it was Morse, CW only, originally with a spark transmitter. But by the time of this 1932 film, in spite of the titles that you'll see, um, they were using something called ICW, which we don't hear about anymore. It was a, a system for making uh, Morse audible from a CW carrier by making and breaking the HT to the PA valve in the transmitter something that we wouldn't even try to do these days. It ensured that the uh, Morse was modulated to 100% by um, a buzzer, buzzing noise. Unfortunately, it made the signal spread quite a bit, so it was quickly outmoded. I think the Victoria Police went over to uh, radio telephone in the later 1930s. However, Let's have a look at the Victoria Police Radio Patrol, 1932. We move to Melbourne now, a city that prides itself on its up-to-date police methods, especially the radio patrol, which swoops on the job within a few seconds of a warning being given. Just suppose, for instance. Are you hurt? I don't think so. I'll ring the fleet. Yes, very well, Mr. Smith. We'll have the patrol car down there straight away. Right, sir. So the police get their man. Clink. OK, what I might do is to go back over that film now and point out um, several of the locales and several features of the equipment that I've noticed. Um, this is VK3AML with a regular Saturday night test transmission and I'm running too much audio. I'm too heavily compressed and that's better. Uh, back to the clip and I'll stop it at several points to point out a few things about it. Now, although this says spark telegraphy from Russell Street, it's not spark. OK, this, as far as I can work out, was shot in Dalgetty Street, St Kilda, which runs off Grey Street somewhat up the hill from the old George Hotel. Move to Melbourne now, a city that prides itself on its up-to-date police methods, especially the radio patrol, which swoops on the job within a few seconds of a warning being given. Just suppose, for instance... Are you hurt? I don't think so. I'll... Book that man for acting. Bring the fleet. Yes, very well, Mr Smith will have... Now, notice that this is the old Russell Street before the present red brick or cream brick building was built. This was uh, originally on the corner of Latrobe Street and Russell Street on the north-east corner 
was a quadrangle of bluestone buildings and this uh, radio room was built in one of those buildings looking out onto the quadrangle and uh, you'll see in a moment a few features of this equipment it's all Morse except of course the phone from local police call boxes which are now a thing of the past uh, but I'll point out something in particular that you should be having a look at. Got a patrol car down there straight away. Right, sir. Onto the key. You can hear all the, the relays going. Now that is the interrupter. It's a sort of a commutator that turns the HT on and off the PA valve. Therefore, um, making the uh, a make and break at about 300 hertz that will be heard very roughly at the other end as modulation. This avoided the need for BFOs in the receiving equipment. They had to keep it simple. There's the patrol car. And I believe that that person sitting in the back seat taking the message down is a man I knew as a very old man in his 90s about 30 years ago Cliff Allison of the Victoria Police Radio Patrol. Back to the film That's the receiver sitting in the back seat probably TRF receiver you'd have to run either a, a frame antenna from the roof or um, um, maybe even run a wire up a pole for the antenna for this and notice in the background you can just see a generator or a Jenny motor I should say to boost the 12 volt of the car battery up to the HT required for the valves for the receiver and notice that Dalgetty Street is uh, mentioned at the top there and uh, some of the subsequent scenes in Gray Street, you'll see ES Gray, Dalgetty ES Gray, it's obviously in the general vicinity. Um, bag snatch. Okay. Off goes the patrol car. Now, I wasn't sure where this was until I showed this film more than 40 years ago to the late Fred Canning, who was on the Victoria Police Radio Control in the 20s. And he tells me that this is the top end of Fitzroy Street, St Kilda. You'd hardly recognise it now. And this is Orty Drive around Albert Park Lake. Now here the scene has changed and I couldn't work out where this was either and according to Fred Canning this is the old Williamstown Road um, in the days when that part near Lorimer Street and near the Williamstown Ferry uh, was basically bare sandy land. You'll notice the police car is very big. I think they were either a V8 or V12 engine very early on, or could have been a straight 12. And according to Fred Canning, they were sufficiently powerful, big and massive, that they could literally push cars sideways off the road and beat them at speed. That, those flats on the right probably are near Williamstown Road too. And the inevitable, they get their man. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. Well having uh, done the Victorian Police Radio Patrol, perhaps now taking us up to 10.15 and uh, the film that we took on a field day with um, Peter VK3 ACZ, his wife Sandra and myself. We were running 100 watts of sideband from a hill uh, to the south side of Belgrave Heights in the southern Dandenong Ranges, a very good location which uh, 
Peter located some, hmm, maybe a year ago, and has been operating from fairly constantly, so I decided to take a peek at what he was doing. But I'll get onto that in about half an hour. Meantime, let's have a film about uh, ionospheric propagation, because it leads in very well to um, the discussion of what we were doing um, in the Dandenong Ranges on Thursday. So this is a uh, very old, it's a 70 year old film made by the uh, American Armed Forces and uh, it's an instructional film on the effects of the ionosphere on HF propagation. It's quite as pertinent today as it was then. So very well worthwhile running this before we get into the actual uh, nitty gritty of field operation that we did on Thursday. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. The United States Army presents the effects of the ionosphere on radio wave propagation, 1950. From Army headquarters in Washington to the far flung outposts of our military forces, radio circuits must be constantly maintained. Skilled engineers tend to transmitters that send their signals across the world and complete the circuit to San Francisco, Tokyo, or Berlin. Distant installations must have similar apparatus. In combat, the utilization of remote and isolated forces demands communication by radio with higher headquarters, sometimes over long distances. There is more to maintaining these radio circuits than simply throwing a switch and speaking into the microphone. As you know, if you've ever listened to a transocean broadcast... This is Robert, speaking to you from London. The news today is on a threatening note. At 10 Downing Street, the... Prime Due to technical difficulties beyond our control, this broadcast from London will not be continued. To overcome as much as possible these technical difficulties and to bring them under control, Military and civilian scientists conducted extensive research. Army channels cannot be cut off as safely as a commercial broadcast. There is too much at stake. Marconi proved by a transatlantic test many years ago that long distance communication was possible. Ever since that time, scientists have been trying to explain fully what happened so that communication can be made more reliable. What did they find? Let's begin with some fundamentals of radio transmission. When an electrical current alternating at radio frequency is fed into an antenna wire, an alternating magnetic field is set up about the wire. This alternating magnetic field gives rise to an alternating electric field, which produces a magnetic field, and so on. This wave of electromagnetic energy is radiated from a normal antenna at all angles and in all directions. The action can be generally compared to expanding ripples on the surface of water. The energy used to disturb the water's surface is propagated through the water by waves, causing the light ball to bob up and down. When the electromagnetic energy radiated from the antenna encounters a receiver aerial, an alternating electrical current is produced in the wire by the radio wave. Thus, contact is made and signals can be received. This pretty picture of radio wave propagation is unfortunately complicated by various properties of the Earth mass and the atmosphere. It is further complicated because radio waves of different frequencies behave in different patterns. In general, radio waves are propagated as ground waves. That is, the wave tends to follow the surface of the Earth. Or as sky waves, which go off skyward. The ground wave, familiar to us as the one used by commercial broadcasting stations, diminishes in amplitude with distance. Its energy is also dissipated into the Earth as heat. Pictured is the surface component of the ground wave. 
It is the method of propagation for low frequencies where the antenna is close to the ground in relation to wavelength. In very high or microwave frequencies, the waves are closer together. They move out from the antenna in straight lines and do not follow the curvature of the Earth to any great extent. We will consider only the portion of the waves which travels in the desired direction. When the antenna is high above the Earth in terms of wavelengths, the space wave component of the ground wave predominates over the surface wave. Radio waves from a transmitting aircraft reach a receiving aircraft by means of the space wave. The space wave has two components, the direct component and the ground reflected component. These two waves upon reaching the aircraft may add or cancel. Generally, we are concerned with that portion of the radiated wave that does not follow the Earth's surface but starts out skyward because of the particular properties of the antenna and of the Earth. Obviously, such waves would be of no use to us if they did not in some manner get back to Earth. Some of them do. When very high and microwave frequencies encounter layers of the atmosphere under proper conditions of temperature and humidity, they are refracted and bent back to the ground. These waves may continue outward, confined between the Earth and the atmosphere layer whose abrupt change in conductive properties has refracted the wave. Sharp changes in either water content or temperature of the atmosphere are caused by weather conditions and are difficult to predict. Radio waves of a less high frequency also come back to the Earth. They are returned by the ionosphere. These waves may also continue onward, guided by the channel between the Earth and the ionosphere. With these main types of radio wave behavior at our disposal, why have we selected the wave returned by the ionosphere as the key to long-range radio communication? Well, let's use the process of elimination. The wave that travels along the surface of the ground might be useful for long distances if its energy were not absorbed so quickly. Too much power is needed in the transmitter to push this wave very far and the space component of the ground wave is limited to nearly line of sight distances. Cross them both off. The wave that is refracted by atmosphere weather conditions might be useful for medium distances if these weather conditions were constant and predictable. They are not. Cross it off. We are left then only with the wave that is bent by the ionosphere. We'll have to use it. Although subject to changes, irregularities, and disturbances, the ionosphere is at least always there to some extent. It is more constant than the weather and absorbs less energy from the wave than the Earth. It is the best medium available for aiding the long-range propagation of radio waves. If that's the case, we'd better learn something about this ionosphere. We've been using the word, what is it? The sun gives off powerful ultraviolet rays. These rays penetrate the envelope of gaseous matter surrounding our Earth called the atmosphere. The rays cause electrically charged particles or electrons to be separated from the atoms of this matter. The breaking up of a neutral atom into electrically charged particles is called ionization. Each atom, upon losing an electron, assumes a positive charge. When the sun's rays are removed, as during the night, the oppositely charged particles attracted to each other tend to recombine. 
Even when the sun's rays are in the process of ionizing the atmosphere, the electrons strike the positive ions and regroup into neutral atoms. A balance between ionization and recombination is eventually reached. The balance is tipped in favor of the ionization activity of the sun in the upper atmosphere. I'll just interrupt there for a moment to say this is VK3 AML testing on 147475. If you want to look at the video component of what we're transmitting, Google VK3 AML 16 April 2022. That's Google VK3 AML 16 April 2022. Back to the ionosphere. The rays are vigorous and the atmosphere atoms are more loosely packed, making recombination less apt to occur. Here too, the effect of the rays lingers during the night hours. Thus, the ionization is greater in the upper regions. The stirring up of all this activity naturally takes energy out of the ultraviolet rays. Therefore, less of their initial energy is able to penetrate to the bottom layers. Less ionization, then, occurs in the lower levels. Here, too, since the atmosphere is denser, recombination occurs more readily, and the ionization does not remain long after the sun's rays are removed. This ionized region exists roughly between 35 and 250 miles above the Earth's surface. It is called the ionosphere. The ion density in the atmosphere does not increase uniformly with height. There is a certain separation into discernible layers this occurs because the radiations from the sun are of different wavelengths. Each wavelength tends to run out of energy at a different level of atmosphere. From the lower layer, the bands of the ionosphere have been given letter designations for easy reference. They are the D layer, the E layer, and the F1 and F2 layers. This is a simplified picture of the ionosphere. Now, how does it affect the travel of radio waves? The process is the same as that which bends the light rays emerging obliquely from water to air, making a stick placed in the water look bent. This is the phenomenon of refraction. The same thing happens when a radio wave travels at an angle between two mediums of different characteristics. When the wave front enters the ionosphere obliquely, the presence of free electrons increases its speed. The upper portion of the wave front encounters the speeding up property first and thus gains a little on the lower portion. This pivots the wave front and changes its direction. The higher the wave goes through the strata of the ionosphere, the more it is bent until it is returned to Earth at the same angle at which it left. The upper portion of the wave front, always being the first to enter the higher ion density and the last to leave, gets more of the speed up effect throughout its travel. Since the ionosphere grows denser somewhat more gradually than this, the path of the radio wave is better represented as a curve, and the turning effect will be continuous. We now have a stratified ionosphere which refracts radio waves and returns them to Earth, in the meantime absorbing some of the wave's energy, the absorption being greater in the lower ionosphere where the atmosphere is more closely packed. Another factor now enters, the frequency of the radio wave. White light, or sunlight, as you know, is made up of all colors, each having a different wavelength or frequency. When white light is passed through a prism, its component wavelengths 
are refracted to different degrees, thus spreading out the light and separating it into the visible violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red colors. In the same way, a certain electron density in the ionosphere will refract a low-frequency radio wave more than it will a high-frequency wave. Therefore, a higher-frequency wave, in order to be returned to Earth, must continue upward until it finds a layer of still higher electron density so that it will be given more pushes around toward the Earth. If it is of too high a frequency, it never gets turned around and goes kiting off through the ionosphere into space. Frequency also determines the amount of absorption to which the wave will be subjected. Consider two waves of widely separated frequency. It can be seen that the wave of lower frequency spends more time in the lower ionosphere, where absorption is greater due to higher atmospheric density which results in a greater number of collisions of the electrons and atmosphere atoms. It is obvious from this discussion that if we are going to use the ionosphere to help us send radio waves over long distances, we are limited in our selection of frequencies. Generally, the longer waves, below three megacycles, lose too much energy by absorption. Very high frequencies above 30 megacycles, on the other hand, are so little pivoted by the turning effect of the ionosphere that they pass through and go off into space. We are left, therefore, with only the high frequency band. In this range, we can choose a frequency that will not be unduly weakened and yet will be refracted back to Earth. Two other factors affect the propagation of radio waves. These are skip distance and angle of fire of the antenna. We have seen that each radio wave receives a certain amount of bending in the ionosphere dependent upon its frequency and angle of radiation. Let us take some frequency, F1, and hold it constant for this sequence. Starting with the beam at a vertical angle, tilt the beam until reflection is first obtained from the ionosphere. Let us label this angle as A. Now we have seen that for all angles greater than A, the wave of frequency F1 is lost by penetration, and at angle A, we have the first reflection. The point at which this wave returns to the Earth determines the skip distance for the frequency F1. No signals will be received at less than this distance for frequency F1. For all angles less than A, reflection takes place because less turning is required and the distance between the transmitter and receiver increases as A decreases. Now going back again to angle A, since this is the critical angle for frequency F1, then at this angle, all frequencies less than F1 will receive more bending and the distance between the transmitter and receiver will decrease. Likewise, all frequencies higher than F1 will not be bent enough and hence will be lost. Although we have talked of rays and beams and shown only segments of waves, we do not mean that all antennas radiate highly directive beams. Quite the opposite is usually the case, and we in our discussion have only indicated the effective usable portion of the wave. Waves are actually radiated from omnidirectional antennas in all directions. The radiations at very low angles are absorbed in the Earth. or lower ionosphere. The upper section or high angle radiation leaves the ionosphere and is lost. This leaves only a small portion of the total radiated wave effective for long range communication. Now in review, what do we have? A stratified ionosphere electron density of the layers increasing with height. It refracts waves in the high frequency band. 
The higher the frequency, the farther the wave goes up before coming down. If the frequency is too high, we lose the wave. The higher the frequency, the less the absorption. The higher the frequency, the longer the jump. When we want to hit a receiving station a long distance away, we send out the highest frequency wave whose effective portion enters the ionosphere at the proper angle to be refracted back to the receiver and yet stay within the ionosphere. There is an area known as the skip distance where no signal of this frequency will be heard. For longer distances, two hop transmissions might be used. The calculations for best circuit operation would not be too difficult if these were all we had to worry about. That is, if the ionosphere was stable and its layers rigidly fixed in altitude and density. Unhappily, this is not the case. Since the ionosphere exists because of the ultraviolet radiations from the sun, variations in these rays change the nature of the ionosphere. As night approaches and the sun's rays become weak and disappear, recombination of the electrons with oppositely charged particles takes place at a much greater rate than does ionization. The D layer disappears and oft times the E layer. And the F layers combine. Thus, the ionosphere varies from day to night. Because of this decrease in ionization at night, the usable frequencies for a given distance will be lower than for daytime. Parts of the Earth are farther from the sun than others. They get the rays at different angles. In polar regions, for instance, with their unusual daylight cycles, the ionosphere is thin, sensitive, and erratic, making radio propagation difficult. Thus, there is a geographical variation of the ionosphere. The Earth's North Pole tips toward the sun in the summer and away from the sun in the winter. This introduces seasonal variations in the ionosphere. Even the sun has changes of mood. Sunspot activity increases in cycles, giving out changing amounts of ultraviolet rays. These cycles seem to vary over 11-year periods, as this graph of sunspot activity shows. Thus, the ionosphere must follow suit and change in an 11-year pattern. This is a slowly changing condition. What about sudden changes? The sun's face is not quiet. Sudden, gigantic eruptions send out abnormal flashes of ultraviolet radiation. These flashes of radiation strike the exposed side of the Earth and cause sudden ionospheric disturbances disrupting the ionosphere from a few minutes to several hours. These SIDs have a tendency to repeat at 27-day intervals, which is the time it takes the sun to rotate. Besides the rays, these eruptions on the sun send unusual amounts of particles toward the Earth. Arriving later than the rays, the particles enter the Earth's magnetic field cluster about the polar regions and disturb the Earth's magnetic field and the ionosphere, causing ionosphere storms lasting for hours or even days. The advent of the abnormal amount of particles from the sun expands the aurora from their usual polar locations to include even the temperate regions. Ionospheric storms usually accompany these heightened auroras. The ionosphere itself has some tricks to play. Unexplained clouds of dense ionization drift through the lower layers. This is called a sporadic E condition. Sometimes these clouds are stable enough to aid in transmission, 
making operation possible on frequencies much higher than are ordinarily used. Major thunderstorm areas, which are located in the tropical regions, continuously send out electrical disturbances through the ionosphere. These electrical disturbances are transmitted in the same manner as radio waves and are heard in a radio receiver as a loud crashing sound when the receiver is in the vicinity of the storm. But generally, it appears only as a background hiss when the receiver is a long distance from the general storm area. The signal arriving from the transmitting station must be made to overcome the noise to be useful by either increasing the transmitter power, using a more directive receiving or transmitting antenna, or changing to a frequency which is less absorbed by the ionosphere. That'll give you some idea of the problems involved in long-range radio communication by way of the ionosphere and how these problems can be overcome. First of all, we must add to our knowledge by continuous research and study of propagation phenomena. Army personnel in the field and at Fort Monmouth are constantly at work on these special problems. The Central Radio Propagation Laboratory at the National Bureau of Standards conducts basic research and long-term studies in the field. And in order to use our knowledge, we must collect data on current ionospheric conditions for the same reason that the weatherman needs regular observations of air temperature, winds, and the like. Ionosphere measuring stations throughout the world constantly check the height and density of the ion layers. Here in Okinawa, an automatic measuring device developed by the Army Signal Corps sends radio pulses of varying frequencies into the ionosphere and automatically records the altitudes from which the different frequencies are reflected by tracing a graph of the layers, heights versus frequency on a cathode ray tube face. Here is basically what the ionosphere recorder measures. The height of reflection, shown in this direction, and the frequency in this direction. Waves of low frequency are returned at this altitude, and the higher frequencies from the upper ionosphere layers at these heights. This is a typical trace. Now here are actual traces photographed at a recording station. These were photographed in the afternoon. Notice the frequency range and the comparative steadiness of these traces. As the daylight fails, note how the ionosphere becomes less ionized, as indicated by the range of reflected frequencies becoming less and less until a minimum is reached just before dawn. Now here are a few ionosphere records made during a disturbed period. This is a vivid picture of the erratic behavior of the ionosphere during a storm. Note the turbulence of the layers, how they vary rapidly in height and reflected frequency, or even disappear entirely. From normal day records and other measurements, tables are produced which show the maximum usable frequency and optimum working frequency for known distances at any place in the world for any hour or season. The type of antenna can be determined, as well as the amount of power needed to maintain sufficient energy in the wave for good reception. Different signal intensities are necessary for CW, voice, or teletype service. By observing trends, predictions are published, giving expected noise levels, which may have to be overcome. Use of this data makes it possible for communications people to maintain long-range radio contact by way of the ionosphere most of the time. The Signal Corps Radio Propagation Section in Washington, D.C., together with its Baltimore Field Unit, stands ready to supplement these tables with advice and recommendations to field radio officers. Consulting services are available for the asking on all phases of communications problems. Radio waves are beamed skyward from army antennas carrying their vital messages to the distant points of the globe. Whether or not the message gets through, 
may depend on how well you can handle the information published in propagation pamphlets and how well you understand those unseen and not always cooperative layers beyond the Earth that make up the ionosphere. And that's where we break off that documentary to give a demonstration of what the ionosphere can do. Uh, I've been very surprised by friends of mine who've said that their uh, suburban locales have rendered HF communication virtually unusable uh, because there are places within easy reach of Melbourne where you can certainly get very good results on 20 metres for example and one of um, the best exponents of portable operation not necessarily with low power but actually with high power is my friend Peter Scott, VK3ACZ. On Thursday, Peter and his wife very kindly took me up to their location where they do all of their um, field work on 20 metres uh, at the top of a hill near South Belgrave, Belgrave Heights, as it's called. And um, we took a video of the activity, which I hope won't bore you. Um, and I'll take you all the way as I saw it. I took a camera with me, of course, a couple of cameras, and uh, this is the result. Portable operation with Peter and Sandra Scott, VK3ACZ, 14th of April, 2022. And I had to get there by public transport, uh, initially taking a tram from uh, Burwood East. This is the tram stop at the end of my road uh, to the bus terminal at Vermont South. That's where the tram terminates. And uh, out on the bus, wearing of course the obligatory mask, it's still obligatory to wear these but very few people unfortunately do. And I checked my uh, bag of tricks to see that all the video and audio equipment was all there with us. At Knox Shopping Centre there's a major interchange where you wait for a while. And then you head for Furniture Gully and you start to see the Dandenong Ranges coming closer. For those who don't live in Melbourne, the Dandenong Ranges are where most of Melbourne's VHF services are. We got to Furniture Gully within about an hour and uh, were dropped off at Furniture Gully Station where I was originally going to wait for Peter to pick us up to take us the last 10 k's or so but in the meantime we had a, a nice lunch across the road to the shops at Upper Fern Tree Gully there very close to the bush lyrebirds can still be found up in that uh, bush there and uh, at a local hostelry I uh, had this repast and of course the obligatory coffee my one addiction. Not into cigarettes, not into booze, but coffee. Uh, and at the uh, car park at Ferntree Gully I was spirited away to this site in Belgrave Heights uh, and specifically to this hilltop which is where Peter has set up a portable station. The uh, power lines are quite distant from this uh, at least 300 metres away, so it's very electrically quiet, there's no lights up there. And here's Peter and Sandra setting up the station for us. Sandra tended not to get into the camera too much, so mostly no, you'll see Peter. That's the 10 metre flower pot antenna on the left, and the 20 metre one right. is being hauled I mean, up that uh, dead tree on a rope. The dead tree, right on top of this hill. I won't call it a mountain, I'll call it a hill. And there's the choke coil on Peter's uh, flower pot antenna. It's basically a coaxial dipole being hauled up there for 20 metres. Half wave dipole that works this way. Um, if you care to uh, freeze frame you can read that yourself, but basically it's a choke with a coaxial dipole above it 
um, a very simple way of getting a half wave dipole up for 20 metres. And with this, Peter's had remarkable success. There are the dimensions down the bottom. Again, if you're interested, freeze the frame. Should be able to read that on 1080p resolution. And um, this is where we started to get results. Okay, Peter, um, what we might do, if you could uh, just take us through the various pieces of equipment, the, the battery you've got down the bottom there, and uh, I notice it's lithium. Any other details? Oh, it's a 100 amp hour LiPo. It's selected because it's light enough to carry up hills. Uh, my glass mat's 35 kilos. I don't carry that too far. Um, I, for a long time, well, portable ops is essential for me because there's a lot of Q, uh, electrical QR at home, so I yeah. come up here for peace and quiet. And you're normally so, at home in Baronia. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was running an NFED uh, yeah. for most of my time. I've only just recently gone for uh, uh, flower pots. Terrible name for them. It, it hardly deserves. It's a, all you need is a length of coax. Uh, the half wave sorry quarter wave of it's with the shielding removed and the other a quarter wave goes down to a, a coil of coax which acts as the choke but anyway yeah. uh, i have two radios that i use for portable there's the 7300 here or the uh, yasu 891 is my portable radios the 100 amp hour uh, battery uh, i've run it for three days and not needed not needed a recharge uh, but these flower pots are my new thing now the uh, 10 and 15 metre flower pots can sit the, the coil needs to be above the ground. For 20 metres a bit more of a problem so I've got to, I've got to find a very high tree branch which I've got here. Right. Um, the only thing I miss with the flower pots is that uh, with the end fed all I do is change bands with the button. <laughs> Okay. With the flower pots, I've got to put up a, a separate antenna for each band that uh, I work on. About what is your peak current from that battery when you're transmitting? Uh, I've, I've had the ammeter on this thing, despite what the book says, runs anything between 18 and 21 amps okay. on transmit. Okay. Uh, and draws a bit over an amp on receive. Right. Um, so, yeah, the, the 100 amp hour battery is way more than I need. Okay. Well, how much does that battery weigh? Could you know off the top of your head? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, no, I'd, I'd estimate about is, 15 kilos. Okay, my glass mat is 35 kilos. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that's yeah. An effort. It's all fairly compact, comparing, considering it's not QRP. Mm. It's very impressive. Well, I've also run. I've got an 818 that I bought recently, and with a little, uh, with a little lipo, 12 amp hour, which is as light as a feather. I've I've got five by two back from Canary Islands yes. uh, with six watts. I was very impressed with that. Good reports with that microphone in terms of audio quality? Yeah, I think so. I, I can listen to myself on the SDRs around the place. In fact, one of the things I did QRP was listen to myself on SDRs uh, around Australia and overseas so I can prove that 6 watts yeah. gets out all right too. Just a question. How did you get into amateur radio in the first place, Pete? Oh, I've always been interested in radio propagation. Funny thing, about eight years of age, I was given a, an old valve Ferris car radio. Mm -hmm. And it was very good on receive, and I could listen to uh, 3CS Colac, 3HA Hamilton, and all that. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand why after dark I could hear Queensland and mm -hmm. Adelaide and Sydney, and too young to know about the D layer, of course. Yeah. And it just progressed from that shortwave radio, listening to School of the Air and The Flying Doctor when it was on AM. That's how long ago that was. It yeah. uh, wasn't long before I discovered the ham bands and knocked around with a couple of hams, and who unfortunately now are silent key. Yeah. But I just regret not having taken it more seriously as a teenager when okay. I could have done things like learn Morse. You got near retirement uh, by the time you got into it all. Yeah, mm. yeah, I, I hit retirement first and mm. tied up with so many other interests and yeah. I haven't looked back since I started. Mm. My big thing is DX, going yeah. around the world. Yeah. Um, well, there's where 20 metres and, and 10 comes in so well. Yeah. Particularly at the moment, you'd be... In your element, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And a long path to Europe in the afternoons just uh, does my head in. Um, 20,000 plus kilometres, fantastic to get a 5.9 report back 
yeah. from somebody, and especially when you're barefoot and they're running a kilowatt, you know, yes. and they're only the few dB that the textbooks say <laughs> should be the difference. Yes. Yeah, it's, yes. it's marvellous. Must be a few caudal hops going for that to happen. Now, is there any story on how you found this locale in the southern Dandenong Ranges? You were trying to get away from power lines? or Well, yeah, well no, the QR Mary caused by neighbours who have a drug crop going that the kids oh. definitely don't care about. <laughs> but uh, I went away with the Sherbrooke Radio Club on a camp up at Big River in the, uh, the high country. Near Eildon. And, mm. Near Eildon. And to hear 80 metres where you could you could hear a pin drop was just amazing yeah. and I had to find that was the impetus for me going portable I had to find somewhere that was quiet like that so portable ops was mm. a no brainer after that yeah and and that's where I benefit from uh, uh, being out Juliet Golf Portable the name is Jeff Juliet Echo Foxtrot Foxtrot and he always has a good signal because his car's right beside Port Phillip Bay <laughs> Is he just on a whip or something? Or? Yeah, on the roof of his car. Big magnetic base, Gosh. 200 watts. He has to stop and then put it on, obviously. He can't go driving around with it. Flash portable, QSL. There's a big picture of three Juliet make a portable. Uh, negative, Juliet Golf. Juliet Golf portable, QSL. So he's only across the bay from us. We're getting him on ground waves. Yeah, yeah. 20 over 9. Yes. Now, how does the noise level here compare with where your home QTH is in built-up area? Oh, well, there's no there's no comparison. For a start, I can't do 40 metres at home when the those glow, grow lamps are going. No. just can't do it because there's about a strength 5 noise through the whole band and there are peaks every 20 kilohertz that's 9 yeah. and above. Mercury so vapour discharge yeah, going on. 40's completely wiped out, 20's half wiped out mm. and 10's the only band I can use. And uh, So here, how many S points better would the noise level be? Would you? Can you estimate? Well, there's almost no noise here. Mm. There's almost... It'd be rather interesting to find out after this experience how how you'd go on One Tree Hill, which is rather higher, but it's closer to VHF sources. You know, I, I wonder if there'd be intermod trouble with the, all the uh, transmission towers up there. That's the, only, yeah. that's the only reason I haven't tried it. The other alternative, a bit further afield, is that the pedestrian lookout tower on Mount Donabuang, which is always worth a try. Yeah, yeah. Because you're up a thousand metres there. I don't know whether the elevation would make a great deal of difference on HF. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the actual height is in metres, Donabuang, but it's 4,100, yeah. if I recall. I think we're only about 250 metres here. We're not all that high. It's just that it's in the clear yeah, and it's yeah. a fair way from everything. Yeah. And obviously, from what we've seen this afternoon, it's fairly quiet in terms of, you know, bumbledom yeah. <laughs> going on, coming yeah. through the, the campsite or whatever. Yeah, but people come walking past with their dogs and occasionally I've got things like... Oh, why are you doing that? I can do that with my mobile phone. Yeah. Yeah, okay. My wife does that all the time, actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah good on you. Yeah. <laughs> all I say. Uh, other people express surprise at that, especially when they hear somebody come up and say, you know, I'm from Romania. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that guy this afternoon from Belize um, on, the, uh, on the Gulf. Yeah. The trouble is that when that happens, there's a stacks on the mill... And then you're waiting an hour to get a, yeah. a signal in. Yeah, it's been an awful day. Well, it's been great in terms of propagation, from what I can see. It's yeah. just that there's such a thing as too much of a good thing, I think. Yeah. Well, I just want to have a chance to say, oh, I might tell him tomorrow, mm. say thanks to Jeff <laughs> for relaying for me. I should have said it when I came up for my call. But, yeah. yeah. Um, there's plenty of strong signals on the band and as we get closer to 5 o'clock, 20 metres, is, we'll go crazy with yeah. Europe. How have you found that rig? What What is it now? A Yesu... Um, no, no, ICOM 7300. I, 7300 ICOM, OK. They're great bang for buck. It, isn't it interesting? You always hear people say a certain radio is rubbish. Well, I don't think there are any rubbish radios hmm. because, because they wouldn't last too long on the market. It's... 
I think some people, if if you pay for the next Dicrom up, the uh, 7610, and pay four and a half to five grand, mm. well, of course, you're going to hang feces on the yeah. 7300, the yeah. junior cousin. But I think there's no better bang for buck, considering all that it will do. Yes. Um, I'm a Yesu man, though. All my other radios are Yesu. Uh, handhelds, base rated, FTDX10. Mm-hmm. Uh, love that. I've taken that portable as well on the Sherbrook Radio Club camps. Yes. Um, and you find the waterfall display useful? For... Oh, wonderful. Uh, uh, best thing ever. Mm. <laughs> best thing ever. At least if you're you know, hunting for contacts, looking for people who are calling CQ, it's great to be able to see who's on the band. Yeah. We're really sport. And this has a touch screen as well, so I see a signal, I just touch it, and it immediately goes there. Right. So rather than tune the dial, I can just keep hitting the screen to move the... Mm. Um, mm. The frequency. And you get quite a few birds around here. Have you had any comments on the air about uh, kookaburras or...? Yes, I what? have. Uh, a G-station uh, wondered what on earth he was hearing in the background. <laughs> I also had another G-station say, oh, you just had a helicopter f- fly overhead and I was so intense and concentrating in. I looked up and, oh, yeah, it's the Medivac helicopter going back to sail. Yeah, it's a nice quiet spot audio-wise too, so you'd probably... Yep be able to step back from the microphone yeah. a bit as you as yeah. I've seen you doing today yeah anyway thanks Peter uh, it'll yeah. be an interesting an interesting thing to review this well, this there's, interview there's something wonderful about going portable and I just wish you'd seen the best of it today well, anyway, I, well, yeah. we'll see if we can dig up a couple of contacts yeah. yet. yep no worries now, um, I should interrupt here to say this is VK3 AML testing with a video of a field day, well, an unofficial field day we went on on Thursday, myself and uh, uh, 3ACZ, Peter, um, and uh, our only VHF contact was through to Jeff, VK3VJS, who will be probably very amused to see this. VK3 VJS, VK3 AML. Yeah, Roger, go again. Yeah, I'm just taking a video so that you'll see this Saturday night. This is the only VHF we've done. Hello, have you got us? I'm sorry, Chris, you keep dropping out. You keep dropping out. How's this, Jeff? Yeah, that's all right. Hang on, I'll just go to swing, swing my video camera around. Bastard of a thing. Do you want me to? Okay, how's that? Uh, a bit noisy, but I can understand you. Okay, I'm just trying to find the best spot for you. Um, we've been working portable HF all afternoon. This is the first time I've tried uh, VHF. I've on a Yesu FT4 handheld, holding it above my head like the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I'll have to wave a Ukrainian flag. Uh, Roger on that. We stand by Ukraine. (laughs) Where have I heard that before? Anyway, you'll see a bit of this on Saturday night. We've been videoing Peter 3ACZ doing his his HF stuff. I hope he had his teeth in and his hair (laughs) comb. I'll never live that down. (laughs) You certainly won't. Oh dear, I'll have to come up, come over. Can you wear a suit next time and possibly a bow tie that spins and, and, and s- sprays water? I would if I had a suit. <laughs> no worries, Jeff. Um, look, we'll catch you later in the evening anyway. Uh, I'm at the south end of the Dandenong Ranges without being too specific. We look, we look out your way quite, quite clear. Yeah, OK. The only suit I've got here, Chris, is a birthday suit. You certainly won't see me in that. Please, spare me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even look at myself. Righto, we'll listen out for you later on, and cheers to everybody up there. We've got uh, 3ACZ, Mrs. 3ACZ himself. Okay, I'll, I'll catch you later, Jeff. Okay, Chris, all the best. VK3 AML, somewhere in the southern Dandenongs. VK3 VJS uh, in Springvale. Cheers. Cheers.
Easily done. Mid-afternoon on 20 metres, the DX was pouring in to an almost embarrassing extent. Okay, well done. Oh, you idiot. Hey, guess what? It works better when you connect the antenna. Oh, yes. Oh, look. So at least you had the juice going through it first. South Belgrave, uh, up in the hills, and uh, I've got three AML with me as well. And good afternoon, Chris. VK3, Alpha Mike Lima. And I have just switched over to the vertical antenna. Are you getting me any stronger? Yeah, one to a 20, that one, 20 B strong, 20 dB stronger. Yeah, we're getting you 20 dB stronger. This is VK3A and on the mic with VK3ACZ. Damn those carabongs. Wow, you are on the way up there. I just uh, finished making this antenna today, Chris and Peter. Um, I'm not sure if Peter's using the same antenna and whether he has it set up as a sloper. But uh, I've got mine vertical. Uh, thanks to Mark's big spider beam 12 metre fiberglass pole. Mind you, in your direction, I'm up against my shed and next to us two-storey house because um, my uh, choke coil is only about one and a half metres off the ground. So um, despite that, hearing you very well. Uh, VK3 AML with that character VK3 ACZ. Back over to you. It's his antenna vertical. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I gather your antenna's vertical. I'm not quite sure... Are we a combination of both here? I'm not sure. Um, Peter has a rope up a tree um, that he can pull stuff up on, which he has uh, installed by taking bowling lessons from Don Bradman, I think, or something similar. How he got it up as high as he did, it's up about 60 feet. Um, so it's doing quite well. We've also got a squid pole here, so I'm almost tempted to run a wire between the top of the squid pole and the tree. Um, yeah, whereabouts are you again? Um, VK3 AML standing by. Yes, uh, Chris, it's Michael here. VK3 can't make contacts in Roeville, so not too far away. And, um, yeah, lovely signal. I, I'm, I'm definitely receiving... Uh, you're a lot stronger on the vertical antenna rather than the big horizontal loop, that's for sure. Um, yeah, uh, I, you two got a leave pass from your Ministers for Home Affairs. Uh, or maybe Sandra is with you, I'm not sure. Back to you. Yes, yeah, Sandra's with us, but um, my wife Prue's in hospital uh, at the moment. Um, I see her one day in two. She's had spinal surgery. It's all good, but she's having extensive physio to get back on her feet. Um, it was fairly serious stuff. She had pressure on the spinal cord, causing to her to lose the control of her legs. And now the control is back. Unfortunately, it's so much control that she's had a sprain out of it. Um, just the amount of control that the nerves are exercising exceeds the ability of the legs to, to, to respond. So she's having lots of physio to get back on her feet and just the last couple of days she's walking without a Zimmer frame all the time, although she needs it, uh, you know, just for steadiness and all the rest of it. Um, and incidentally, we're videoing what's going on at the moment, so you may see it on one of our Saturday night sessions. VK3CMC, VK3AML with... Uh, uh, oh... ACZ. Uh, AC, 3ACZ. Gosh, I blanked. 
Why is it the most familiar things you blank on? VK3, uh, it's called getting old. <laughs> VK3 CMC, VK3 AML. Uh, fine there, Chris. Uh, and, and hello to Sandra as well. Um, sorry to hear that about Prue. I spoke to Prue. You probably don't remember when you were over in Deal Island, I was talking to you and you gave me your home phone number and said, could you please call my wife, Prue, and let her know that we have arrived okay. safely. And I did that and I got a message back to you, yes. So I, I have spoken to Prue and sorry to hear that and I hope she heals quickly. And um, yes, I have um, watched um, your YouTube uh, the, the, the videos you put up, Chris, and um, yeah, I, I don't often watch all of them. They tend to go a bit long for me, and I, 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 I uh, lose concentration. But uh, I have seen some things of interest, and my friend Gary v, VK3 GLC, um, he, he enjoys your. Uh, I don't know if we call them a podcast, but he enjoys taking part in your sessions as well. So I'll put it back to you. Um, the three amigos up at Belgrave South from VK3 CMC. Yeah, I don't know where Sandra's gone at the moment. I think she's going, going on a nature walk or something while we're, while the boys do their boy thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the rig we've got here. Um, it's a dirty great big lithium battery that Peter's got connected to this thing. How many amp hours? 100. Sorry? 100. 100 amp hours, yeah. gosh. So we're running a bit of power here, are we? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll have to think about getting a, a decent sized lithium cell, but then all of mine at the moment are 7 amp hour and they're designed for kind of the 10 or 20 watt level. Uh, obviously we're, we're dragging more and more irregularly on sideband. Um, but uh, isn't it amazing what lithium technology has done and how fast it's becoming cheap? VK3 CMC, VK3 AML. VK3 AML, VK3 CMC. Well, it's working fine. Um, I don't know if I gave you a signal report. You're probably 10 dB past an S9, so loud and clear. Nice audio. I, I assume it's the IC7300. Nice, clear audio. I am also running off battery power at home. I run off I've got a big 120 amp hour lead acid deep cycle battery and I've got a couple of solar panels out on the back lawn that keep all this charged. I am transmitting at 100 watts, Chris, today. Um, like you, I use smaller batteries for my QRP radio and Peter was with me the other day when my battery finally died. So I'm looking at a 7 amp hour lithium um, from JCAR. I have a 7 amp lead acid battery, but that is no good for hiking. It's it's just too heavy. So I, I finally killed my LifePo battery after all those years. I had a good run out of that, and it's time to buy a new one. And I hope Peter is okay. He gets very excited if 20 metres is opening up. I did hear uh, Doug over on Lord Howe Island maybe half an hour or more ago on this band. Um, also running a halfway vertical and 8 watts is coming in quite well with his 8 watts. Um, I think he's the one that likes to set up portable. He takes his bicycle out. Anyhow, I'll put it back to you. Enough waffle from me. Uh, VK3 AML with VK3 ACZ. VK3 Charlie Mike Charlie. Yeah, VK3 CMC in the group. Hi, hi, VK3 ACZ. Yeah, well, uh, uh, we might uh, uh, go and scroll around the bands for a few moments. Uh, we're going to come up on the Anzanet. I'm going to give uh, Chris a quick uh, crash course uh, in the Anzanet and see what we can do and uh, then have a little bit of time. I've got the 10-metre squid pile up, so we'll, uh, we'll have a go at 10 as well. Wondering if you heard much activity on uh, 10 and 11 this morning. You're the go-to man as far as uh, the higher bands propagation there, Michael back to you um, I had a brief listen on 11 metres this morning uh, Peter when I got home from work and the usual strong AM stations coming in from uh, North America um, 10 metres there was no one on there, um, it was dead <laughs> so um, hopefully that answers your question 
Yeah, yes, Michael, that megahertz seems to make a difference, or nobody knows it's open, so they don't try one or the other. Okay, well, look, well, like, we'll get to it. Um, I heard um, Florida Kilo 4 Uniform Hotel down there on 160. I might uh, see if we can grab him, and uh, that's 0.160, not 160 metres, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, get on to the Anzanet soon. Anyway, good to uh, catch up with you, and uh, yes, your antenna is going very, very well. Uh, it's the... Uh, 20 metre hung vertically out of the tree. I was so grateful when we turned up here and nobody had pinched the uh, rope that I left there from the last time. I did have my end fed as a backup because there was no one known, even with the new uh, fishing sinker, was I going to uh, hurl uh, a rope over that height again. <laughs> anyway, enough of that, Michael. Um, uh, catch up with you later on and, and thanks for coming up. VK3 CMC, VK3 ACZ. Yeah, just briefly, Peter, I, I built uh, another one that's of those antennas. That's what I'm using. That is what I'm using now. Um, so you finally got it vertical, did you? QSL, QSL. Yeah, well, that that. Uh, but I, I did that on Saturday. But that's in a separate location. Um, where I've been uh, working some days, I don't have the tree with the height, and so it's in a uh, 45 degree sloper configuration, and still works perfectly. I was getting five nines uh, from the states with the kilowatt stations 10 dB stronger. So, uh, uh, yeah, the flower pot works vertical or at 45 degrees, no doubt about it, Michael. Ah, beautiful, and it should even have a lower. Um, radiating angle today so maybe it may even work a bit better okay and i built another one of the, um, today and that's what i'm using now so uh, i will let you go um and good afternoon to you too chris and i will listen to you too um pile up all those contacts cheers for now vk3 cmc back to listening Roger, Roger, Michael. Well, I'm so glad you built another one. I was worried that you were going to come and try and take back this one, hi, hi, <laughs> out of my cold, dead hands. No, 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 it's been wonderful. Thanks again so much. Your, uh, uh, your ability to build antennas is appreciated. Uh, cheers, mate. 3CMC, 3ACZ, going clear. Cheers, guys. And that was the end of our local contacts. Um, we did immediately go over to doing some fairly good DX, which I'll show you now. And if you care to, um, if you care to dial up VK3 AML 16 April 2022 on internet, you should be able to find our internet posting, our YouTube live stream with the video of the audio that you're listening to, the corresponding video. We did actually video all of these contacts while we were up there in South Belgrave. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima with a regular Saturday night test. Back to the video where we did some decent DX. With Peter VK3 ACZ at Belgrave height. Fantastic DX on 20 metres. Trying to sign into the ANZA DX net, the conditions were so good that we were crowded out on the 14th of April, Thursday. Uh, VK3 Alpha Charlie Zulu. Charlie. No, good afternoon, Mike. I'm glad you're there. VK5, YL, for the early checking, for the VK3, Alpha Charlie Zulu. I think that's a true Charlie Zulu. That's the new one on me. QSL. VK3, Alpha Charlie Zulu. Good day, Cheryl. Alpha Charlie Zulu. Charlie Zulu. VK4, November Hotel. Alpha Charlie Zulu, VK3, that's Peter. Thank you, VK3, Alpha Charlie Zulu. I mean, okay, your turn. Anybody else VK3, Hotel. Chris? Yep. When you can get a. Oh, all I had there was 50 kilos too. Could someone relay for me, please? 
Oh, here's a new one. Sounds strong. Is that ill? Yep. Well, we got Alpha Charlie 6 Papa Zulu, but he, he wasn't too strong. The net will start at 0515 UTC, but if you'd like to join us, please call now. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima Portable in the Dandenong Ranges. VK3 AML. Okay, Vic Kilo 3 Alpha Mike Lima, thank you very much for joining us. Could I just have your name for the log? I just don't remember it, Alan. Yeah, I haven't been on before, so the name here is Chris Charlie Hotel Roger Item Sierra Chris VK3 uh, AML. Right, Echo, and I'm just doing a relay for Shirley. You make it quick. Welcome to the net, Chris, stand by. And I got the whiskey Alpha. Wait a minute. Uh, come again, Ed, I just forgot your call sign. Actually, I knew there were nine in there somewhere, John. Well, that's it. Mike Alpha Delta in Montana. I heard you there, and there was somebody else. Try again. It's 2017. Golf Tango Bravo, Zulu Lima 2. Golf Tango Bravo, VK4 Julia Tango assisting net control. Good afternoon, good evening, Gordon. Would you like to make a call, over? Victor Kilo 4, Julia Tango, Zulu Lima 2, Golf Tango Bravo. Not quite happy to listen. Uh, you're all good signals here. Uh, very good afternoon from Taranaki. Roger, Roger, Gordon. I'll work you so that everybody yeah, can, give you a, 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 yeah. a, a, can hear you and maybe give you a call back. Zulu Lima 2, Golf Tango Bravo from Victor Kilo 4, Julia Tango. 5 and 9, Gordon, 59. The name is Mike. And uh, Mike QDH City of Rockhampton up in central Queen, Queensland. Over. Thank you very much for the report there, Mike. Uh, you're up to 10 over 9, 10 over 9 into uh, the central Taranaki on the west coast. Roger, Roger. Thank you very much for that good report. You just made a little bit over the 9 on that over, so that's good. The conditions are great today. Thank you, Gordon. Please stand by. You might get some calls later on. You will. Uh, cheers for You'll now. get a call from me. All right, next station, I'll change antennas again. That antenna is really working for you, Mike. I hear you switching it around. It makes quite a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, no calls, uh, uh, Mike, and surely I can hear you most of the time. So uh, anyway, there we are, Mike. Over. He's five or nine if you want to call him. Thank you very much for that. Here's our first rare DX, V31AX, Paul from Belize. Victor 31 Alpha X-Ray, Victor Kilo 4, Juliet Tango. Good morning, good afternoon. You have joined the Australia, New Zealand and Africa DX net. Uh, could I have your name for the log and would you like to make a call to anyone that you've heard, over? Uh, Victor Kilo 4, Juliet Tango. This is Victor 31 Alpha X-Ray. Good evening, you're 59 the name is Paul, Papa Alpha Unicorn Lima, and I believe I'm sorry that you, you, you are Victor Kilo 4, Juliet Tango, is that correct? QSL, Paul, QSL, Victor 31 Alpha X-Ray, this is Victor Kilo 4, Juliet Tango. Net control today is a YL, her name is Shirley, it's her call sign, Victor Kilo 5, Yankee Lima. Oh, yes. And she's in South Australia, the oh, bottom end of yes, Australia, yes. hi, hi. And, and um, I'm in Queensland, which is in the top half of Australia. But you're welcome to the net, and I'm sure if you can stay around for a little while, you're going to get quite a few calls, Paul, over. Okay, well, I'll stay around for a few minutes. What's your name there? Oh, sorry about that. My name is Mike. Mexico, Italy, Kilowatt Echo, Paul, over. Okay, can you just give me my signal report, please? QSL, you're 5 and 7 to 8. 5, 7 to 8, Paul, over. Uh, 
Sandra had taken up a separate position by this stage and was doing, I think, a few phone calls to friends. Um, she didn't want to be in the video particularly, but it was nice to have her there. Um, but uh, usually she was standing behind the camera. This is VK3 AML with our regular Saturday night test. How dare we? We were disturbing the peace of this little reserve in South Belgrave, in Belgrave Heights. Thank you for the five and three, Paul. You are five by five into Melbourne. Five by five into Melbourne. Okay, five and five into Melbourne. Got it. Uh, back to net. Seven three, Paul. Back to net. We've got a new country. And there's Peter getting himself a new country, Belize on the Caribbean, near Guatemala and uh, Central America. I did, I did. Lima X-ray 2, Arthur Mike, Ricardo, are you still Lima on Lima X-ray, yeah, that's uh, yeah, up, 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 up. Lima X-ray 2, Arthur Mike, are you on frequency, Ricardo? LA2, where's that? Yeah. As you can hear, signals were pouring in from all over the world, and a lot of them were noise-free. Yeah. Um, I spoke to him the other day. Yeah, cue yourself, cue yourself. Okay, well, look, uh, Shirley, would you like me to try another list? Yes, please, Mike. Okay, sorry to take over the net on you. 
but this is VK4 Julia Tango assisting net control. We have a special DX station on frequency, Victor 31 Alpha X-ray. There's been a number of people that give him a call. Is there anybody else on the list that would like to call him now? Please call. Sugar X-ray, Mike. Sugar X-ray, hello, Bob. I was wondering where you were. I thought you might like a call. Anybody else like to give the special event, special station, not special event, the Victor 31 a call? Call now. Jim from Rarotonga, Echo 51 Juliet Delta from South Cook Island. Stand by, Jim. We'll give you a call in a second. Uh, anybody else like to go on the list, please call? V VK3 AML. Uh, VK3 Delta Mike Lima, yes sir. VK3 Alpha, Alpha Mike Lima. Yes sir, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. This guy is in Italy. Station uh, in the background, uh, just a second. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima, good copy. You're 5757 in North Italy through the long part. My name is Stefano, Steven. Uh, back to you, over. Thanks, Stefano. Um, we're actually portable, running about 100 watts portable from an IC7300. Uh, we're about 40 kilometers east of the city of Melbourne out in the bush, surrounded by, um, you might hear some birds singing if we're lucky. Um, but I've just come out here with VK3 Alpha Charlie Zulu. He set the station up and we're seeing what we can get. Lovely to hear you in North Italy. And give him a signal IZ2 report. ZSF VK3 AML. Fantastic, fantastic, uh, Chris. Uh, VK3 AML, AML, India Zulu 2 Zulu Sierra Foxtrot. A uh, very good copy here from time uh, 59 on the picking, uh, 57, 59. Uh, beautiful condition. Give him a signal report. Today. I'm using three element Yagi. I've been in long part in your direction with about 500 watt. Uh, and uh, my transceiver is 5101 uh, Delta. Wonderful, um, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, I wish you the best and uh, hope to see you again uh, on the air. Victor Kilo 3 Alpha Mike Lima, Italy Zulu 2 Zulu Sierra Fox, and take advantage for wish you happy Easter. Thanks very much, Stefano. It's uh, really a privilege to be able to speak to you from such a remote location here in the middle of the Australian bush and uh, to be able to talk with uh, reasonable clarity. We're actually running off batteries, 100 amp hour lithium. Uh, lithium polymer uh, and um, the IC7300 isn't making too much of a dent on that so that uh, we're not fading away as the afternoon what rolls on. It's just coming on to evening now anyway. I'd better sign, leave you to other stations. Signal I said to ZSF you're well over strength 9, probably about 15 over 9, uh, VK3 AML. Fantastic condition, and uh, we hope uh, we, we hope uh, this uh, fixes in the time. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, Victor Kilo Three Alpha Mike Lima, seventy-three from India Zulu Two Zulu Sierra Fox Tau. Seventy-three and Ciao Stefano VK Three Alpha Mike Lima now clear. Yay! Vediamo un po' qui la chiamata dell'Old Camel. How was that? That was good. <laughs> How are you? So that was Chris. That contact you had was good because he gave you a seven peaking nine. Hmm. That's the normal QSB. Sometimes yeah. it's caudal hops or whatever, but the signal does not vary one bit. It just stays absolute rock solid. Hmm. And it's, and it's always way over nine when yeah. that happens. Yeah. It's not a bad day at all for this sort of thing. Mm. The trouble is everybody's hopping on. Mm. Victor Kilo 3, Alpha Charlie Zulu. Victor Kilo 3, Alpha Charlie Zulu. Uh, very good afternoon. Thanks. You're five and nine. Strong signal, isn't it? Roger, roger, Eddie. Same with you, uh, eastern suburbs of Melbourne, uh, close to sunset. You're... And this was Wales. Uh, we're just coming to the end of the video in uh, two minutes time. I'll open it up for a QSO on 147.475. Back to the end of the video. Uh, 5 and 9 plus 5 dB. Name Peter. Papa Echo Tango Echo Radio. Uh, Mike Whiskey Zero. Uh, Yankee Victor Kilo. VK3 Alpha Charlie Zulu. Yeah, sorry about that, Peter. 
Yeah, I, there was somebody called and I just waited to see if I could hear them, but obviously it must have stopped. Yeah, it was great to uh, get you out of um, uh, Melbourne, I think you said, down there in uh, Baronia, I think it is, I am on your QRZ. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, nice to the table, Peter, cheers out. Roger, Roger, Eddie. Yeah, you were absolutely booming into Melbourne. Uh, great to have made the contact. And uh, Jeff, uh, Juliet Golf, listening on the side, thank you for the relay before you let me get a Belize station I'd have not got otherwise. So, anyway, uh, good to speak with you, Eddie. I wish you uh, a best for Easter and let you get on with the next station. And uh, you're really coming in very strong, Eddie. Uh, cheers and 7-3 to you. Over. Peter, have a great afternoon, mate, and uh, enjoy the Easter with the family, and uh, we'll catch you again, no doubt. The Victor Kittle theme of a Charlie Zulu, light whiskey zero, Yankee Victor Kittle. Thanks again, Peter. Cheers and be He's in England. Cheers and beers. Bye-bye. Do you want to speak to him? No, 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 but he's in England, is he? Yeah, Wales. Wales? Yep. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I'll just say, Bob, it'll be well over. Final shot. This is packing up, striking camp, Sandra leaving. on the left. <laughs> yes. And so the sun is setting over there and it's goodbye to beautiful And we're keeping the location secret, VK3AML. Uh, back to local video, thank you. And thank you very much to VK3ACZ who are no doubt listening at the moment. So at this time of night, we're a little late, 11.03, but uh, we usually open it up for a QSO on 147.475 megahertz. Just looking at the radio to see that everything's working okay, seems to be. I can hear myself off the air. So with that, um, I wonder if anybody's about for a QSO. Just checking my levels. VK3 AML now calling CQ on 147475 and standing by for any calls. Yeah, VK3 Echo Charlie Golf. And VK3 Alpha Charlie Zulu. VK3 Golf Lima Charlie, good evening. Three, that's a good start. VK3 CG Dave. And we have the star of the show, Peter, with us. And VK3 GLC, whose name I just got. It's been a few weeks, and I'm 68. And I've got a neurone attrition. I always blank on that name. Um, he said, flicking back weeks and weeks and weeks. You'll have to fill me in again, I'm sorry. Um, no. Nah. It's not on this book. Uh, so, look, I'll first take Dave, VK3ECG, and one of these days I must submit you to the same excruciating torture to which I've inflicted Peter this week. VK3ECG and group, VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML on the group, VK3ECG. Yes, fine. Um, oh, look, great video tonight, and uh, I thought you were a very kind interviewer. Um, and nothing like the sort of things that we're starting to heat up and get in the uh, election um, uh, running up, but um, uh, a, a certainly a more civilised and gentlemanly occasion one couldn't imagine. Um, yeah, delighted. Um, in fact, I was out today at Port Royal, and I, um, Peter and I had a quick chat on, uh, I think we were on 15 metres, weren't we, uh, Peter, actually. Um, I wasn't having as much luck as he was, but then I was running a considerably less power, the considerably less elaborate antenna system um, this, this, this afternoon. So, um, so I was probably only running, oh, probably not quite 10 watts, actually. Um, and uh, I had a a ground-mounted um, whip-type um, uh, quarter wave uh, with just, I uh, only had about a half dozen radials out, um, and that was doing, uh, I mean, certainly um, signals were crashing in. Uh, I, I worked a couple of Italians, but um, which isn't bad, given that I was only running uh, barely 10 watts, um, and I, I hiked there with my backpack, um, not very far, really, um, hammered in a, a, a small post into the ground 
uh, put this whip up on that. I ran out some radials and sat on a log. Uh, <laughs> considerably less comfortable than, than your rather nice setup at that location, uh, uh, Peter. And um, had a few ants crawling over me, and a few mozzies were getting me by the by the end. Um, but I just, and of course, some changing bands. I actually had to dismantle my antenna and then put it up again by taking sections and segments out of it because it's a it was a solid. Um, uh, um, uh, antenna, so I just had to take sections out, um, but I'd actually um, got all those presets, so I don't ha didn't have to um, do any sort of um, um, antenna analysing or anything like that. It was all preset. Um, but I think next time I shall probably have a go at um, um, using the uh, dipole, something like that, and see or in bed and see and see what happens. But very interesting the flowerpot antennas. I do remember those sort of antennas from some time ago. Um, uh, there were, um, I believe they have been made for sort of uh, 2 and 70 as well, but um, there were a, a couple of companies, I think, manufacturing things which worked on the same principle of, of essentially you, you've got a vertical um, halfway that's sort of virtually centre-fed. Uh, centre um, at least that's how I, I imagine they work. Um, but perhaps you can tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong there. Anyway, back to you, uh, Chris, uh, VK3 AML and the group. Uh, VK3 ECG. Listening for breakers, didn't hear any. Yeah, um, well, I was very impressed with the way that flower pot antenna uh, worked. I, I, I presume CMC has just done a bit of measurement on, on, on them with an antenna analyzer before setting Peter up properly with it. Um, but considering that it's, it's such an easy, flexible antenna, difficult to break, easy to throw up in a tree. I was exceptionally impressed with the performance on 20 metres. Um, that and the low noise of the site were uh, both incredible. And Peter, you've done very well to locate both and a decent rig and a decent power source. So I think you've got the thing sewn up. VK3ACZ... Um, and presumably Sandra saw that too. VK3 AML. At CMC. And CMC. Oh, well, we're getting quite a group tonight, Chris. There you go. VK3 AML on the group. VK3 ACZ returning. Um, good evening, Gary. Good evening, Dave. Uh, oh, I was speaking with Michael only a couple of hours ago on six metres, so I won't say good evening. But, yeah, I've, uh, I'm sure to have given the credit to... Uh, uh, Michael as the antenna designer, uh, so, uh, uh, manufacturer, and he does an absolutely fantastic job, as you saw, Chris. Um, first, uh, just a couple of quick comments. Absolutely loved the uh, Victoria Police uh, 1930s uh, film there. Uh, interesting, because I... While watching it, I really wondered where that scene out the middle of nowhere was, and I still remember uh, Williamstown Road there, uh, down towards the uh, the ferry, uh, having that sort of concrete strip on it. It it really, as soon as you said it, I thought, oh yes, yes, it's the same same surface. So uh, absolutely marvellous, and and I hope um, uh, Jeff was watching that. Um, the other thing. <laughs> Boy, I didn't realise what a great face I have for radio, hi hi. I don't know why I was doing all that squinting, I really don't. But uh, uh, I was hoping you'd catch a bit more of the bug there, uh, uh, Chris, uh, <laughs> that you'd be out there uh, with your own portable system as quickly as possible. But, uh, yeah, I can still attest that the, um, uh, the half-wave coax antenna is working well. I got five nines from Bulgaria, France, and uh, a couple of other places. I know it was only a five five from Hawaii, but he did say that he was beaming back towards the States. Um, it was good speaking to Dave uh, briefly on uh, 15 metres. Uh, Dave, your audio sounds absolutely brilliant. If that's an example of what the uh, 705 is like, uh, really top shelf stuff. Anyway, uh, great, great broadcast tonight. I have to say that, don't I, Chris? Uh, back over to you, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It was only looking at the video afterwards I realised that when you're concentrating and talking on the air, you close your eyes. Um, <laughs> I'd never noticed it before. It's, I suppose when you're editing a video uh, and looking at it closely and repeatedly, as I did when I was taking sections out, it turns out I shot something like three hours of video 
out of which I took the best 45 minutes. Um, should have taken a few more cutaway shots and I should have got a sander a bit more to give um, the uh, the wife's impressions of ham radio on, uh, on, on the interview, but uh, noted that she was reluctant to get in front of the camera, so the few shots of her that I got, I only got by stealth, <laughs> including that final shot of her helping us with the packing up. Um, we Certainly I was chatting with her for quite a while, uh, but uh, you, you wouldn't know that from the video because she was judiciously behind the camera most of the time. Um, so we go through to Gary, VK3GLC and Group, VK3AML. Hey, good evening and thank you, Chris, VK3, Golf Lima Charlie. Trust everybody is well. Um, yeah, the, this uh, Tonight's presentation was all well received at this location and uh, most informative as usual, most enlightening and uh, yeah good to see a little bit of portable operation up on the hill and uh, my neighbour's dulcet tones there, good evening Mr CMC and uh, yeah, I managed to get out here tonight, uh, I've got the grandson this weekend but uh, uh, everything's quiet in the house, so I thought I'd escape. I uh, had to bring some stuff down here and uh, turn off a couple of computer bits and pieces, so I thought I'd finish off the night with uh, uh, hopping in, just make a few comments. Um, yeah, watch your last couple of uh, weeks' presentations also. Um, last week's television uh, was good, and uh, the week before that with your... Uh, software to find uh, receiver stuff and uh, you mentioned uh, VK5 um, ARG uh, yes at uh, Tarlee, that was uh, my previous home location before I moved to uh, to Victoria um, although I was uh, a little bit further down in the valley than that but uh, I know exactly where that location is spent a bit of time up there working on the commercial stuff um, a nice place to be and uh, a very good view all around and uh, their uh, receiver has certainly worked uh, very well. Back to you Chris, VK3 AML and the group VK3 Golf Lima Charlie. Yeah, VK3 GLC and group VK3 AML, well working well is a mild way of describing that software defined receiver that they've got at Tarly which is in a magnificent location, magnificently engineered and with a very good uh, software defined receiver on, on the front end um, because the other week I happened to get up at something like 4.35 o'clock in the morning insomnia and just on spec I tuned to 160 meters, you probably saw this a couple of weeks ago and received Latvia and Lithuania quite clearly on sideband about strength 4 to 6, R5, uh, on the top end of 160 metres. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Certainly couldn't hear that here, but then, you know, urban environment and all the rest of it. Apparently there was a, a, a major Europe-wide contest on, so every band was crowded but why we could only hear the Baltic states is a very good, honest, very question, particularly on those frequencies where um, you're hoping for the D layer to be thin. Incidentally, um, just going back to um, Peter, uh, I heard that the day after we were up at Belgrave Heights, there was a solar storm or a solar mass ejection which wiped shortwave reception out so we were very lucky with the day it was wind, no wind so it was excellent for recording audio out in the open it was dappled sun so we didn't get sunburnt and i didn't get harsh shadows with the video conditions on short wave are excellent it's just very lucky that whole that whole show um and it just goes to prove that even in the edge of 
the urban environment, there are some quiet places where you can get HF operation working st extremely well, even with all of the switch mode power supplies and noise sources of Melbourne with its, uh, what is it, a population of 5 million or something, uh, all within 60 kilometres. So now we go over to VK3CMC, the designer of the said flower pot antenna we've just been demonstrating. Um, I'd be curious to know whether you, you, you did some work with an antenna analyzer in cutting it to length, but it, from what I could see, um, calling it a flower pot antenna is a bit of a put down. It's basically a coaxial dipole of a certain type with a choke to stop the RF going back down the lead, unless I'm wrong. Um, VK3CMC for some informed input on that subject, VK3AML. And no one else heard. Uh, VK3 AML. Uh, good evening, Chris, and good evening to the others. Oh, we've got some uh, sirens happening here. They may be heading around the corner to Gary's house. Uh, I think they're coming to get you, Gary. Um, yeah, well, I'm definitely not the designer, but I do build them. I do make them. And yes, Chris, I, I use a borrowed antenna analyzer. And uh, I even, to build the 20 metre version, given that it is over 10 metres long, um, a bit over 10 metres long, and with the choke coil as well, I also had to borrow a bigger squid pole. So uh, Mark VK3MDH kindly lent me his spider beam pole, which is 12 metres, and I was using that earlier tonight. Um, so yeah. And what I've found though, my calculations have been pretty much spot on. Um, I allow a bit extra at the top and so I can fold it back on a loop and heat shrink and put a cable tie through there. So for anyone that wants to hoist them up a tree like Peter does, and um, I think Peter will confirm the SWR is pretty much flat. Um, so my calculations have been really good. They do work very well. Um, and, uh, and, and the video, Chris, I must say, it was uh, um, really demonstrated that your contact into Italy, uh, northern Italy, um, was fantastic. Um, I think it was S9 plus both ways. So, and I actually watched it all tonight and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I liked the uh, first video you put on the Victorian police, uh, the historic footage. And uh, it was like watching a, an early episode of Homicide Police or something, uh, very dramatic. And what I really uh, I found quite amusing was I'm pretty sure when they were apprehending their uh, fugitive, one of the police officers actually jumped from the police car onto the fugitive's car as it was uh, moving along, which I don't think would be standard practice these days. Um, one other question, Chris. Uh, the, the, the television uh, broadcast you did, you made a, uh, you were commissioned, I believe, to make a, a replica of the mechanical television transmitter, and uh, that was very well made, by the way. I think you had some help from others. I'm just wondering if that is still in existence, if it's in a warehouse somewhere, whether it was stripped down for parts. So maybe um, uh, you can answer that question, whether that... Uh, uh, all that effort went into making that, whether it still exists. Um, my antenna is low tonight. I'm, I'm hearing everyone quite well, so I'll leave it at the low height. Uh, back over to you, Chris, VK3AML, VK3, Charlie, Mike, Charlie. Yeah, I left enough of a gap. VK3CMC and group VK3AML. Well, the answer to that is I don't know where that devices now. Uh, I heard from the people who put up the Screen Worlds exhibition, it was called in 2009, that some items have been archived and some have been tossed away. I don't know what the status of that outfit is. Um, it, the design was somewhat interfered with after I finished it by display people who reduced its capability to by putting a a still picture in front of it it was intended for people to step in front of it and see themselves by mechanical scanning both in the camera and in the receiver and we got it working quite well um, basically I, I used a book 
published in 1933, called Television for the Amateur Constructor. Um, and you won't find a single cathode ray tube anywhere in the book. <laughs> it's all scanning discs. Uh, it tells you how to punch the holes. Although uh, I have to admit to cheating a bit with the accuracy of the punching of the holes in the scanning discs, we got it done by a laser cutting technique using uh, stainless steel. Originally they used aluminium which they punched but uh, that produced burrs which kind of produced streaks on the picture. I wanted to give the best impression of mechanical scanning because there's really nothing wrong with the concept. Um, the idea that it can't give pictures as good as electronic is, is actually quite false and there have been in the last 20 years several specialised uh, picture display devices that are based on mechanical scanning. A, a thing made in a display device made in Taiwan called the Dynascan is an example of that. It uses a rotating strings of modulated high output LEDs to produce a high definition television picture in full colour. Uh, so John Logie Baird's ghost lives on. Um, but it was an interesting job making it for a museum display because unlike the original uh, mechanical TVs of the 20s which were based on very low efficiency uh, alkali metal vacuum photo cells and neon lamps as the light source for the receiver. The neon lamps would um, go dark, pardon me, by cathode sputtering after only you know a hundred hours or so. So I had to get something that was modulat modulatable and a lot brighter and um, um, had some longevity so of course I looked at Luxian LEDs there's a we put a, uh, a series connected string of six Luxian LEDs behind a diffuser behind the uh, scanning disc and that produced pictures of quite reasonable brightness in a color appropriate to uh, synthesize the color of the original neon but uh, yeah I had help from um, I'm just Vic Brown, I can't think of his call sign, he's in Britain, but the Narrowband Television Association had been uh, cutting scanning discs with laser cutting and uh, they used stainless steel because it can be made thinner with the holes, lighter, and also it, it doesn't, stainless steel conducts heat much less well than aluminium, so with a laser cutter you can cut stainless steel much more cleanly. Um, so with a bit of a cheat, I should have used the original punching method, but they gave me only two and a half months to get the whole thing built. It was like um, most government jobs, they spend 10 years getting the money and then having got the money they want it built yesterday. I, I've been holding it too long. Um, interesting about the spider beam pole incidentally, I must find out more about that. Round to Dave, with a pause for any other breakers, VK3CG and group VK3AML, and uh, brilliant on the uh, 15 metre work, Dave. Yeah, VK3AML and the group VK3ECG, and, and good evening to Gary and uh, Michael and so on. Um, yes, uh, I really, I must say, I had the same view as... <laughs> As you on the um, on the uh, on the video of the police uh, operations, um, uh, I thought that the furious driving wasn't was moderately furious. I suppose I was, uh, of course, I suppose in this modern era you wouldn't see people jumping from a, a police car to the offender's car. You might see a pit manoeuvre. I suppose um, I'm not sure what would happen if you tried a pit manoeuvre in those sorts of cars. I think that could be very interesting, um, <laughs> but. Um, uh, and I'm sure that the, you know, WorkSafe would have something to say about climbing from vehicles and so on. I actually was a little bit concerned right at the beginning. I, I, I liked your comment, Chris, about the award for acting on the part of the, um, uh, the Good Samaritan, who seemed to violently shake the poor victim um, in a way that was, would only have caused some more distress. And from the shooting point of view, I thought I thought her head came quite close to the rocks when she when she was uh, acting as the victim and having her handbag snatched. 
and going to the ground. Uh, that could have been quite nasty, actually. Uh, if she'd moved about three inches to the one side, I think she would have had a bit of a, a head problem. But there we are. Um, but I thought the, uh, the, the, it's fascinating, isn't it, how sometimes those old films, with their little bits of analogy and things like that, which is rather antiquated, really still, still tell you uh, in a very clear way um, the whole of the scenario around, uh, around propagation and so on. And I thought that was actually uh, really quite a, a, a valid, and you could use it today, and I think it would be... Uh, just as useful for um, you know people trying to understand ha what happens with propagation and and so on and so forth. I, I certainly did like the um, the uh, the film of the um, the radio the radio stuff that they were using there, and that buzzing was just just amazing. Um, as you say, it must have been causing causing splatter all over the place. But then again, there probably weren't too many other stations uh, around at that at those times to cause much of a problem in those days. Um, but uh, yeah, there we are. Um, the um, I, I must admit, Peter, I did like the uh, the battery, and um, uh, although um, be interested to know the, the the real weight, I've been looking around, seeing whether I should should try to get something a little bit larger. I mean, I don't need anything larger for the QRP, of course, but. Um, uh, and my battery systems, are, uh, the small portable batteries that seem to be fine for that. Um, but uh, uh, if I do decide to take something a little bit more powerful out and about, then um, uh, obviously something like a, um, a decent uh, size lithium battery would be would be nice. I noticed actually they had some in Aldi recently. Um, uh, they all disappeared extremely rapidly, though. I was a bit late, I think. Um, uh, but. Uh, uh, but the prices of those have come down um, uh, uh, tre tremendously. Um, thank you very much for the audio report. Yes, I was a bit interested to see what, what was actually happening, because certainly uh, I was being clobbered, I think, by a lot of stations when I was calling in. I was just being, I was just being swamped by um, you know, very powerful stations running massive kilowatts in Europe and so on, and uh, running, running um, 10 watts into a, into a ground quarter wave is... Um, uh, probably not going to cut it, even if I was on a hilltop at the time. Um, where I go to is, is um, there's a couple of places I, I go to. One is uh, is um, Fourth Hill in Warrandyte, which I've told you about. I think it was up amongst all the gold mines behind the pub. And um, that's quite a nice little spot. And then the other one, of course, is the Mount Lofty, uh, which is not a mountain, um, I keep saying this, uh, at Onga Park. Um, but the one I was at today was... Um, actually part of the Warrandyte Park and it's at Glynn's Road which is um, as a dirt track essentially um, it's, it has got um, sort of uh, houses in it and then they sort of peter out as you get into the forest bit and there's an old farm there, Glynn's Farm and um, it's long abandoned and it's essentially it's on the other side of the, um, the Yarra River almost opposite the, the tunnel um, in Warrandyte, so, uh, but you have to go quite a long way around to get to it. Um, uh, so you have to cross the river and then work your way up um, towards research and then take one of the roads off there, and that eventually leads into Glen Road, and then that eventually takes you to this park. Uh, and not very far from where you, you, you park the car, um, probably only about 100 metres in, is probably the highest point. Um, it's a bit... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the more worrying things is gum trees losing limbs in that sort of place. Uh, but um, we go a bit further, you come to some very nice open flat grassland, and um, uh, and that's where I think I might try the um, try the uh, a dipole rather than the um, uh, the, the quarter wave. Um, but certainly, what would very interested in, the, uh, in those flower pollen tents would be quite fun to put that, something like that up, and uh, uh, and there's plenty of trees. Um, uh, uh, in, in where I, in, certainly at the Glynn Roads place um, it's not a place I suspect that's going to get a lot of traffic or a lot, lot of visitors um, most times I've been there there has hardly been anybody else there at all so um, um, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, a nice spot a nice spot, a nice quiet spot and the noise level was, was very very low there um, not that it's particularly bad here actually which is, which is a, a great relief um, Okay, well, uh, back to you, and um, 
Will, uh, oh, Peter, I did listen to a few of the, the Chinese contacts uh, and tried to get them, but again, I was, um, I think I was just, just not getting a strong enough signal out. Uh, certainly heard the South African um, station, is it Otto, um, um, ZS3Y, and he, uh, he, it was a very nice signal, but I think he was disappearing and moving on, so I, um, uh, apart from a couple of Europeans and so on, I didn't do terribly well. I think I was just right there and then down in the noise for them. OK, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ECG. Yeah, uh, look, uh, interesting in the way DX goes, and Peter Parker has um, mentioned in the text chat uh, that uh, he said nets are great for testing receivers, um, but it's far easier to make DX contacts independently and having seen the crowded nature of that net during uh, a significant band opening, which we presumably had that day, uh, I think I would try to call CQ independently somewhere else in the band um, unless I knew the people in the group and wanted to get in touch with them. But really it was too much of a good thing. I mean, you, you, we gave a, a call, I think, into the net, and it was a good three quarters of an hour before I could say anything. <laughs> and even then it was, as Peter kept pushing, um, just give your call sign and a reception report. And I thought, hmm, hmm, <laughs> that grated a bit. Peter, you've been asked about the battery from several different points of view. I was impressed with it, though if I had to walk any great distance, 100 amp hours would be more than I think I could cope with even in lithium. Um, it felt like, you know, I, I didn't get a measure of what the uh, weight was, but I would say, just picking it up and feeling it while I was there, around 15 kilos would be close to the mark, maybe 20. Uh, my little 7 amp hour lithium cells that are the same size shape and arrangement as a standard seven amp hour gel cell sort of an oblong thing um feather light um and they're quite capable of driving for limited periods uh a 15 or 20 watt fm vhf transmitter and indeed that's what i used when i was on deal island which um uh, 3CMC will recall. I think I actually spoke to him through it at the time. Um, so Peter, VK3ACZ, I hope you feel that I did justice to the great favour you did me um, in in uh, inviting me on this uh, venture and uh, I think we got a reasonable video record out of it. VK3ACZ and the group VK3AML. VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. Yeah, just uh, you didn't do what I hoped you'd do, which is uh, blur out my face. And uh, uh, note to self, stop squinting and lose the 30 kilos that I've put on in the last <laughs> couple of years. I can oh, do boy. that. Yeah, um, a few comments to make. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Dave, in relation to your QRP operation, well, don't worry, I spoke this afternoon with uh, Fox 6 Alpha Romeo Charlie, uh, the very next contact after Peter Parker with his five watts and uh, so he, he was getting in there I didn't hear what his signal report was but uh, he was doing a good job uh, with his five watts where I, I cheated by using a hundred and uh, the, the uh, strength seven I gave you uh, Dave on 15 metres was probably worth more than that because uh, I forgot that there's a, I mean I know we don't quite get the knife edge that you do with VHF, UHF but there's one tree hill between you and me so uh, you were climbing over the top of that. Um, going back to the uh, video with the police communications, the first thing that puzzled me was that the car would pull, pull up alongside a woman and steal her purse uh, with a man walking towards them. Uh, I don't know, maybe crooks are that uh, bold and that blazon. Uh, I don't know. Um, and my favourite moment of the video, Chris, was the pile-up that happened for the Belize station. I, I want to defend the Anzanet a little bit. Uh, I know Peter Parker's not too keen on them, and, and with good reason, but uh, I like it because I'm uh, 
I got very discouraged early on in my DX experience getting killed in pileups. And remember, there are certain two-letter calls. There's one in New South Wales that everybody knows. There's one in Tasmania that everybody knows, and they'll call straight over the top of you. There's no honour amongst uh, thieves as far as amateur radio is concerned. There are certain people that, uh, um, you know, it would be uh, politeness to um, wait your turn, but they don't. And the worst thing about it is that the... uh, uh, the DX stations honour them, even though they've called over the top of you or in the middle of your QSO. Um, oh, Sandra's just brought a set of scales out into the uh, shack, and she's going to weigh my battery, so I'll be able to uh, tell you. I would guess that it was seven or eight kilos, but uh, it, yeah, no, just put the battery on the. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, and. Uh, yeah, now what else did I say? Oh, yes, solar storms. Yes, we uh, had some G2 level activity, Chris, uh, that happened uh, not long after we finished. Uh, in fact, I got back from uh, d- dropping you home and noticed that the um, the K index was up to uh, five or six or something like that. Um, funny, uh, I went out and did the Anzanet on Friday uh, and uh, I got from Stan Kilo Echo 5 Echo Echo in Florida. Uh, he was 20 over nine. He gave me a... a uh, five over nine. Um, the Europe didn't come in as well as it often does, but we had. Um, well, I, I got two Italian stations, including your friend Stefano. Mind you, he was five nine, and he gave me a five five. I just noticed the band uh, wasn't twenty meters. wasn't very crowded. Is all. I don't think I'll ever understand how the ionosphere works. <laughs> you know, it, it it doesn't black out. It seems to depress it all, but not. Um, not to the extent that it, um, well, as I said, you were still getting five nines from Europe on the long path, just not many. So what was the weight? 9.9 kilos. Well, there you go, Chris. Uh, the battery weighs 9.9 kilos. Anyway, enough waffle for this um, this over. Oh, I'm pleased to say the solar figures are, are returning um, and uh, propagation was certainly good again today. And that, uh, that uh, VK4JT, Mike, who we heard a lot from Rockhampton there on the internet, he is a bonzer guy as far as net controllers and all that. He has helped me so much to get contacts I wouldn't have got otherwise. So, uh, yeah, there's a place for DX nets. Um, uh, horses for courses, maybe, but uh, I like the camaraderie with the... Um, meeting up with the people and after the net's finished sometimes you get the chance to have a bit of a, a chat with them I think there's a camaraderie and for me it, it works uh, <laughs> back to you Chris, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ Gosh Peter, um, VK3 AC... <laughs> ACZ in the group, VK3 AML returning, well I, I would have estimated that that battery was about 15 kilos and uh, the fact that it is actually 9.9 or 10 probably means that I'm becoming an aged weakling. <laughs> Everything feels heavier than it did 10 years ago, including me. But in my case, it probably is the truth. <laughs> I've been enjoying the good life feed-wise, I must admit. Um, and uh, with regard to the police car... I forget, the, I think it was a Daimler. Um, I interviewed, I was lucky enough to be around uh, 40 years ago when the members of the, the original Victorian Police Radio Patrol, some of them were still around. One was Cliff Allison, who you saw receiving the uh, message in the, in the patrol car, who I knew as a guy in his late 80s, early 90s. And the other one was Fred Canning, who'd actually been involved with the uh, design of some of the gear in the cars, the receiving gear, regenerative detector, fairly simple stuff. And uh, uh, I remember Fred Canning telling me that they originally had two types of cars in the 20s, both of them really big and overpowered so that they could outspeed and outweigh any other car on the road to push them off the side of the road if they had to um because you must remember this is this is the period not far out of the times of squizzy taylor they were dealing with some fairly serious crooks and um uh, the two types of cars originally used were the daimler which is the car that you saw and uh, uh, i think it was a french car called a lancia 
or it could have been a, another type of British cars, and Fred Canning told me that the Lancia was a death trap. Um, the Lancias had an engine made of low melting point um, alloy, and there were a couple of incidents in the 1920s of those cars being run up to full speed, which I think in those days was about 60 miles an hour, but considering the weight of them, that was fairly fearsome. And at full speed, if you ran them too long, they had an inefficient cooling system and the motor would seize at full speed, um, literally tearing the car apart and tearing apart the occupants. So they were very quickly discarded and uh, given over to the Daimler. I suppose the, the old thing of us being the child of the mother country came into it with the selection of a British a British automobile. Around to Gary, VK3 GLC and group VK3 AML. Uh, yes, Edmund, uh, yes, indeed. Some of those vehicles were uh, certainly very interesting. Um, uh, one of my colleagues uh, was working up the mountain some years ago. Um, had, he, uh, um, had his old Chevy up there a couple of times just to give it a bit of a run. He said, it's not too bad coming up the mountain. He said, but um, yeah, uh, a lot of engine braking involved going down the mountain because I don't, uh, I don't trust the braking. <laughs> Um, yeah, not a very good thing running out of brakes uh, rolling down Mount Dandenong, but um, yeah, very interesting vehicle to uh, punt around in, but um, considering some of those uh, larger vehicles that uh, didn't quite have the uh, latest safety technology, um, would have been most interesting. But, uh, you know, you've got to start somewhere, I suppose, and... Uh, things were just a uh, smidgen agricultural uh, for sure but uh, certainly good of, that you were able to uh, uh, pick the brains of the uh, the people that were uh, in the know so as to speak um, and uh, it's certainly uh, good to present it like that uh, I thought it was bad enough a couple of radios I got kicking around in the storage shed um, of old uh, TCA 1677s, uh, the sort of thing you used to bolt under the dashboard of the Kingswood or the Valiant. Uh, I'd like to try that with a modern car. Um, you probably end up uh, losing the dashboard <laughs> completely. Uh, those things weigh a little bit. Mm. Um, I think it's uh, one of the uh, first sort of hybrid uh, VHF. FM transceivers of the day with the uh, QQE0620 output stage and uh, germanium transistors in the front end of the receiver. Uh, very popular for amateur conversion, I believe, especially for the old uh, channel A, B, C, and D. I think I have a two metre version of one of those in there. I'm not sure what channels it's got in it, but. Uh, I'll have to have a look one day. Might be interesting to get it going again. VK3 AML Group, VK3 GLC. Before we go on, Gary, could you give us a quick um, rundown on what Tarly's like and uh, was there some reason for 5RG sticking their SDR there? Back to you. Um, yeah, sure, Chris. Um, yeah, Tarly's a, uh, a small town in what we would call the uh, gateway to the... Uh, Gilbert and Clare Valleys um, sits around about 38 kilometres north of Gawler, which is the uh, northernmost uh, metropolitan town. My first head station in joining uh, what was then Telecom Australia in 1983. Uh, we were a country station then, and uh, head office was in Kadena, but uh, it Tarley is uh, 38 kilometres north of uh, north of that. And uh, on the main road to uh, Clare, has uh, also got another branch off road that uh, runs through to Kapunda, which is a uh, was a, uh, a very big cotton mining town uh, in the early days. But um, Itali was also on the route uh, through to uh, 
uh, Burra, which was another copper mining town. But, uh, population is variable, of course. Uh, last time I looked at the uh, population marker, it was around about uh, 180. Um, probably not that many people in the town, although uh, when I was over there a few weeks ago, the um, there's quite a few new houses within the within the town, but uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the population are on the outlying properties. It's uh, it's rural and uh, varied uh, agriculture. Um, you know, wheat, chickpeas, uh, canola, that sort of stuff, uh, along with uh, a little bit of cattle and uh, and sheep farming. Um, they could have t uh, chosen two locations there, well probably three locations, uh, but it's just a matter of getting site access which would have been the main uh, the main drama. Uh, the one they've chosen I believe is Taylor, Taylor's Gap. Um, it's uh, prob probably close to uh, I don't know, four or five kilometres uh, east of uh, east of Tarley um, and sits up on a hill that, uh, that looks uh, right across the Barossa Valley and then back into the city of Adelaide and uh, around uh, out into the um, York Peninsula and uh, lower mid-north. Um, very, very, very electrically quiet. Uh, you do have overhead power lines but they're not uh, significantly high voltage lines and uh, they're fairly sporadic. Um, mainly in the town itself but, but and then I think there's one uh, one swirl line that uh, r rolls up to the top of the hill to uh, power it's probably now three commercial sites up there mm. and uh, it's one of the major sites for the uh, um, the uh, Metropolitan Mobile Radio Service which uh, takes into account all of the emergency services uh, that's up there along with a couple of um, um, telecommunication uh, base stations. So it uh, would have been an ideal spot because it's right on the top of a hill. There's no vegetation on the top of the hill and uh, it's clear all the way around. Um, there are two other sites, probably Peters Hill, which is a bit further north, but um, because it's on the Hyacin Trail, uh, managed by um, Parks and Wildlife, I believe. Um, permanent access and access to power and stuff like that would be uh, um, an issue. And then the other uh, the other site, halfway back to uh, towards Owen, has the um, another commercial site there. We used to be um, South Australian gas pipelines. Um, once again, power and access to the site, although it's on private property, um, I'm not sure who owns that property at the moment, and uh, it varies as to whether they like uh, other things on there. So the site they've chosen, I think, is, uh, is pretty good, but it's uh, electrically very quiet, and I had a, a really good run of it there, especially on HF, and uh, although most of my activities were um, VHF, UHF. Um, of course, down in the town, you're sort of fairly shielded from everything, but uh, there was certainly uh, good propagation back into the mid-north uh, Clare region and also back, back down into uh, southern Adelaide as well. So um, that sort of gives you a, a rough idea. I think it was about 100-odd um, metres above sea level uh, right down in the bottom of the town, but I can't give you the exact figure for the top of Taylor's Gap, but um, it was sort of significantly higher. Um, yeah, hope that uh, gives you some sort of insight, uh, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's it seems to be a good place to uh, avoid tropical storms and uh, reasonably dry, but still with enough air moisture to avoid static build-up. So, uh, just um, the excellence of the connection with the internet the low noise of the receiving site and the very clever design of the antenna which I believe is a, an, effectively an extremely thick vertical two crossbars separated by about 30 feet vertically 
with four wires coming down so that effectively it's a, a pole about a metre thick. It, it sim simulates a, um, a vertical conducting device about a metre thick. So of course it's extremely broadband. It um, doesn't have to be huge if you've got a quiet front end. Um, but they've uh, very, very clever. I, I don't know who actually was involved with the design of it, but it just, uh, pardon me for saying so, urinates on the uh, receivability of most Australian web SDRs. So we go round to Michael, VK3CMC, and uh, again, congratulations on the uh, results, Michael, with the... Uh, flower pot antenna um, when I heard flower pot antenna I, I imagined something like a tin pot with a wire sticking up the middle of it I had no idea it was effectively it's just a coaxial dipole made in a very clever way to avoid the engineering problems of most coaxial dipoles VK3 CMC VK3 AML Melon Group No one else heard VK3 AML VK3 CMC well, first of all, I have noted that uh, Sandra carried the scales out to the shack to weigh Peter, and Peter cleverly threw the bat threw the battery on there instead and got a weight for that. Well done, Peter. A good way of avoiding the scales. Um, yeah, it's a, a good antenna, and David mentioned a quarter wave. I've built a quarter wave. Uh, well, I've got a couple on the shed roof, a couple of aluminium vertical rods, I'm using the uh, metal shed roof as some ground plane. I've built a portable one there I've got for 20 metres, um, which I haven't really used. I've tested it. And as uh, David mentioned, the biggest downside to, uh, say, a quarter wave or even a five-eighth wave uh, vertical is you require those the, the, um, the, the grounding or the ground plane radials. And... Um, and once, especially once you get up, uh, uh, sorry, down on the lower bands, um, uh, can be a real pain, especially if you, you want to set up quickly out portable, and plus it can be a tripping hazard, etc. Very, very messy, time consuming, and that's what I like about um, a half wave uh, antenna is it's ground independent, you know, when you've got it configured as a vertical. So, yeah, I, I, I think they work fantastic. Um, Peter and I do not like the name flower pot like you, Chris. It, um, as you mentioned, it sounds silly. It sounds dorky. Um, I think of the flower pot men, a show I used to watch when I was a child. And um, yeah, the, in Great Britain, I've seen them uh, referred to as a T2LT, which is also difficult to remember. So um, we're just going to call them a a, 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 a half wave coaxial antenna I don't know what else do you call it very simple in design uh, yeah a piece of scrap plumbing pipe PVC pipe and uh, a length of coax and a connector I mean and they roll up as you saw at the end of your video Chris so you just roll them up and uh, put them in a backpack or whatever and off you go and just on that the portable operations I, I do a lot and I love it I have been for a few years um, one thing to keep in mind is it's lovely to get up on a hill. And by the way, that's a, a lovely spot, Peter. It's the first time I've actually seen it. Um, I've spoken to you when you've been up there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in, and I think you've all mentioned you need somewhere that's RF quiet. I'm lucky my QTH here, I don't have any neighbours that I know that are growing drugs or anything. So <laughs> it's quite it's good. Um, I don't have much noise. Um, but working DX on the HF bands, of course... You don't need to be up high. Um, you've got signals going out and coming in via the ionosphere. Um, so you can even be down in a bit of a valley and it, it still works really well. Um, and even at sea level. I know when I set up over on French Island, um, it's fantastic. And Peter Parker has proved it too. So for the less fit or the less adventurous, they can just go down to the beach and set up down there and work DX. And um, yeah, there's no need to climb a hill. So we've got the, you know, at um, many options, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
and uh, it's sometimes it's nice to be up in the bush and I definitely love that and other times it's nice to be down on the beach the only thing is of course uh, down at the beach you do need uh, usually a, a telescopic pole because we don't have those big trees with that um, I may stick around for one more over uh, my minister for Home Affairs and Finance is probably wondering why I'm awake at this time of night and why I'm out in the shed. I'll put it back to you, Chris, VK3AML, VK3CMC. Yeah, Michael, um, just um, as a quick retort to you, have you heard that the uh, Tortoisehead House run by Phil Bock uh, and his wife at Tankerton burnt down about 10 days ago um, so now there is no accommodation place except for the glamping which costs about $200 a night and uh, home rentals there had you heard that just back to you through CMC through AML no I hadn't and uh, that's some bad news um, obviously they do have the fire station over there um, I when I go over um, we camp, I'm usually with uh, one or two other amateurs, um, we, we hike up to the Fairhaven campground on the beach there. Um, there's a drop toilet, not sure if you've been there. It's, it's probably about five kilometres walk there and back, but no real big hills. So, yeah, we, we just camp up there, Chris, or, or otherwise I just go over there for a, a day trip. No, that's some sad news, and... Um, I, I, I trust no one was injured. Back to you. Well, no person was, but Phil uh, and Yuki, I think her name is, um, lost their dog in it. It. Um, uh, I, I haven't got the details. All I know is I've seen a photograph that was published on their Facebook page, and it's basically raised. Um, only outbuildings survived and Phil was saying rather dismally he doesn't know how he's going to make a buck now. Although I would imagine somebody who is sufficiently into real estate, as he is, would um, fairly quickly find a, a means of building a, a, a ladder out of a financial hole that this might cause. But it does mean that French Island accommodation at the moment has, has gone skyrocketing in cost effectively as a result of the dormitory accommodation, the YHA-style accommodation that Phil and Yuki used to provide being gone. Very, very bad news, um, because French Island is one of my favourite places, in spite of the bushflies and in spite of the mosquitoes. It's a fascinating wilderness area very close to Melbourne that not many, too many people have exploited. I know Peter Parker has been over there. There are several uh, of his videos on it. But uh, I can't help but feel sympathy for Phil Bock, poor guy. Back round to Dave, uh, VK3 ECG and group, and uh, uh, considering that um, the uh, uh, lady of the house probably wants you to retire, Michael, if you're not there on the next round, I will understand completely, as I think everybody else will. Around to VK3 ECG, uh, Dave... And, um, yeah, as I say, I, I hope eventually to uh, get out and get some video of you various people doing your portable thing because everybody seems to have a different uh, antenna, a different setup, a different radio with a different configuration, which is always interesting to see. And I'm sure other people feel that way. And as I have the video gear here, I might as well. VK3 CG and group VK3 AML. Yeah, VK3 AML and group VK3 ECG. Yes, fascinating. Um, yes, well, I'm glad about the weight of the battery, so uh, that means that carrying it around isn't going to be uh, quite so bad. But I noticed you had a nice, you had a good trolley there, which I think uh, obviously solves the issues. Yes, I, I completely agree for HF. I mean, really, uh, the hilltop isn't isn't the thing, and in fact, probably with the with the uh, better reflection off off ground, the the, uh, the beach side as as Peter so often shows us um, three way on, on, on his videos uh, it's obviously a fabulous um, situation and I, 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 as I think it was said in the chat the slopes um, going to be interesting as well and it makes you wonder when you of course with a low angle radiation on, on um, 
on, on corner waves, um, uh, it, 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 it'll, it will be very interesting um, to see whether the, the difference from a quarter wave down in a dell as opposed <coughs> to um, uh, a dipole, which is likely to be a little bit better, I suppose. Um, but there again, I mean, I think there's um, it's horses for courses and things to do is keep playing around and see what works. And um, uh, I've played around recently and just, and just um, put together some different wire things, um, um, made up an infed um, half wave, and uh, I haven't made a flower pot, but um, I, I'm quite intrigued to have a go with, with a piece of coax. And I think that's, um, uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, concept. And of course, the uh, not needing radials is, is useful. Um, uh, a couple of there's a couple of commercial um, uh, verticals that, that do a similar thing and are centre fed, but uh, it's an interesting way of in, sort of end feeding but not end feeding, um, which is which is quite neat. And the radials were, I mean, I like most people sort of complain bitterly about radials, but at the end of the day, you just get a lot of wire, and, and it's interesting. You don't need to make your radial, especially if it's lying on the ground, because you need to get enough earth. Uh, conductions and, and so on, so that really you're, it's not going to be uh, the length of the radial isn't, isn't critical. There are some extremes, you don't want to be too short, and actually, you don't want to be too long. Um, and so, that sort of compromise 10 12 feet is probably um, uh, uh, quite good. Um, and will we'll, um, certainly in, in, in the, for the um, upper bands, uh, but um, really, uh, you're probably going to find that you know, uh, adequate. And there's the diminishing returns, of course, when you start increasing the number. Uh, probably would be better off not just having the six I had today. Uh, perhaps doubling that would have been quite a good idea. But the reality is that the, the amount of gain you get starts to tail off very, very rapidly once you get um, over about 16, 32, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, for what I was carrying around in a tiny little pouch, all these little bits of wire wound up, they did a bit fiddly, but um, uh, I had some just put some connectors on and uh, multiple um, bits of wire into the into the connectors and all worked reasonably simply and easily and wrapped up nicely with some of my daughter's hair ties so um, uh, no no difficulties no difficulties at all and and one cyclist did ride over all my radials uh, which did spread out over the path um, but uh, it didn't do any any real harm so I wasn't terribly um, worried about that um, but um, yeah it's uh, uh, I, it, I think it's quite fun building different things. Um, yes, your comment at the cars. The I think the Lancia was, well, I think the Lancia was um, uh, was Italian car. Um, what was the other car out there? Lagonda was the other one that was around sort of those times, I suppose. But uh, uh, yes, those those alloy um, engines uh, could be dreadful. And in fact, they went back to them, of course, in sort of in the sort of 70s and 80s with a lot of the sports cars having alloy heads and engines and, and of course they overheated and uh, the head would warp and then you'd have to you know bring them in have the, the engine block and the head skimmed um, to get them um, level again I think the, the Triumph Stags had them and uh, mm. some of the other Triumph cars which some of which the police used um, uh, I've only had a couple of really fast trips in police cars, and I must say, um, it was pretty scary, I have to say. <laughs> there we are. Back to you, Chris, VK3 AML, the group VK3 ECG. Yeah, I've never taken a ride in a police car, I'm proud to say. <laughs> but I have some friends in the force. I, I, between my two, well, the long-term girlfriend I had in the 80s, and my present wife, uh, I went out briefly with a policewoman. Uh, never rode in a police car, but her own car was um, a little bit overpowered as well. <laughs> um, interesting experience anyway. Um, at one stage, I, having done some pretty leery things when I was young, like flying kites at 5,000 feet, I when she asked me if I had a police record, I said, I honestly don't know. But if there is one, it would be for something that would read rather hilariously because I was a bit of a science nerd and used to push it a bit. Um, and uh, a week later, she came back and said, you know that police record you said you had, you don't have one. So that was a bit of a relief. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think I've had anything that would cause one since either um, 
The only thing tonight, uh, I did notice that for some reason, uh, after I'd been screening the two run-throughs of the police video, there was a notice of potential copyright breach uh, coming from YouTube live stream. So it may be that after I have this permanently uploaded as a uh, permanently accessible upload that I have to push the trim button which they provide on YouTube live stream and that part will be excised. I've done that before. I take the philosophy with using vintage material to err on the side of usage. Um, you can never predict what will be in copyright. So I go by the, the motto seek forgiveness not permission and that seems to hold me in good stead on on uh, on internet uh, i for example if on the odd occasions i use videos from fellow ham radio operators either i know them well or i guess that they won't object um, and that applied to roly uh, who's a zl2 but uh, I came a cropper on one occasion with a chap and uh, just simply agreed not to use any of his stuff again. If people feel touchy about it, well, that's their prerogative. Um, but, uh, you know, you can put up these things in the best of faith and find yourself coming a cropper. Uh, I remember a classic case of it. Um, I would never have predicted this. I used the audio, the music, from a wax cylinder cut in 1911 by Victor Herbert and his orchestra playing selections from his own musical which premiered in 1909 called Naughty Marietta. And I got pinged for copyright. They actually, YouTube excised the audio on the upload uh, because apparently in the 1930s, Jeanette MacDonald and Nelson Eddy at MGM had made a film of Naughty Marietta and they re-copyrighted the music at that point. But that's the sort of thing, it is, it is so hit or miss. You just have to judge whether you might run into trouble and if you do, take steps at that point if you can. Um, so, round to Peter, VK3ACZ. I somehow think that that rig could probably be run on a battery a half or even a third the size of that 100 amp hour one, Peter. And would I be rude, um, Peter, VK3ACZ, in asking how much that knocked you back in cost? Because looking at the size of that thing, I would have thought that it would be a significant proportion of the cost of the whole outfit. VK3ACZ and group, VK3AML. VK3 AML and the group VK3 ACZ returning. Uh, well, I'm not too sure if I can tell you. I think I parted with four greenbacks, but it came through um, a relative of Sandra's who's a Sparky, and he got it at trade. I don't even know where he got it. He just... Uh, uh, but I, I realised that four bills for a 100 amp hour battery was a, was a pretty good deal for a lithium. Uh, he assured me that it was at least 50% uh, of what it otherwise would be. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. I could run uh, a much smaller battery. Uh, Paul, uh, three AHM uh, member of the Sherbrooke Radio Club, makes a little 35 amp hour battery pack, which I use sometimes when I'm sitting in the car. Um, so uh, I really uh, that that the 100 amp hour glass mat and <laughs> means I've got three batteries to rely on. Um, I don't know, I just think sometimes what if I have a really uh, cranking session that goes on for all day and all night because sometimes I'm out there for uh, 10, 12 hours at a time. Uh, Stan, who I mentioned before, Kilo Echo, 5 Echo Echo, has a uh, 40 metre net um, from over in Florida where he calls in VKs regularly. So I, c I can arrive at my portable location at midday and still be there at midnight. In fact, the um, Christmas Eve, uh, the day I get a year older every year. I arrived there at about lunchtime and I, I packed up at about 2.30 uh, Christmas morning, having uh, worked, of all things, an Israeli station on, uh, 
uh, on 15 metres at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> so much for 15 being mainly a daytime band. But um, And I, I certainly didn't say uh, Happy Christmas to him. I, I, let him uh, I let him say it to me first. Uh, wouldn't want to uh, offend anybody there. Um, <laughs> if the happy video you showed of the... Um, uh, the car pursuit and all that is copyrighted. I'll be so disappointed, Chris, because uh, that for me was the highlight of the whole, uh, the whole broadcast, uh, the whole test transmission. But even so, if, even if it is, I'm so glad I saw it. Uh, I, I just absolutely loved that. And uh, Dr. Dave, you mentioned uh, being in police cars for um, high-speed car rides. I hope they realise that uh, by the time you get to see somebody, uh, there's no need to be really hurrying. Hi, hi. Uh, and that just reminded me of the old saying that uh, you know I joined the police force so I'd be the first person in my family to ride in the front of a police car for a change. Ha ha. And uh, last comment for this round, uh, Chris. I also liked hearing the Karawongs. That uh, came through very nicely. Uh, just what a pity we didn't uh, get kookaburras as well because I often <laughs> hear them uh, when up at that place. And uh, I appreciate it because it's quiet and out of the way, not necessarily because it's on the top of a hill. And oh, my last little defence of uh, the Anzanet again, I, I want to assure you and everybody that that pile-up for that Belize station, I, of all the many hundreds and hundreds of times I've been on the internet, it's never been like that. Truly, <laughs> it runs in a very orderly fashion because the net controllers are all really good at what they do. And uh, again, as I said in the previous saber, I love the camaraderie. It gives me a chance to guarantee that I work at DX station because uh, it's all right for you people with your uh, with your. Uh, multi-element Yagis and, and your kilowatts and whatever else. <laughs> well, there's, there's somebody locally that I'm pretty sure is running more than the allotted 400, but I hope you know what I mean. Yeah, anyway, enough waffle. Back to you, Chris, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. Yeah, VK3 ACZ in the group, VK3 AML. It's always struck me, you know, that uh, if you had two spider beam poles, I know it would cost a fantastic amount, but you should be able to organise, a, for 20 metres, a small Sturber curtain. If anybody knows what a Sturber curtain is, it's basically a hanging series of vertical dipoles interconnected for gain. Um, and, uh, you know, a as a substitute for a Yagi, it, it may actually prove to be more portable and I do note that uh, with that 20 metre flower pot antenna, um, um, Peter didn't mention, um, apparently a critical point is that the choke has to be well clear of the ground. So it's not just the height of the vertical part for the transmitting, it's um, keeping the, the choke clear of the ground and ground effects apparently is important too. Um, I'll hand it round to VK3 GLC Gary. And Gary, do, do you know anybody tied up with the VK5 ARG group, or um, are there people actually from Tali who are involved with that radio experimenters group? They certainly seem to know what they're doing. Uh, VK3 GLC and group, VK3 AML. Okay, no worries, Chris. VK3 Golf Lima Charlie. Um yeah, the ARAG's been around a little while. Um, I do know uh, a, a, a couple of the lads. I occasionally see them uh, when I'm over uh, visiting, I have, although I haven't been to a ham fest now for uh, some number of years. But uh, a very good bunch of knowledgeable chaps. Uh, a lot of them have been involved in uh, various industries, uh, whether it be two-way radio or... Um, even DSTO, Defence Science and Technology, and uh, various other ventures. So they're a um, yeah, very knowledgeable crew. Um, as far as I know, uh, there is nobody locally there. Um, I could be wrong. <laughs> I've been known to be wrong before. However, um, I think uh, I was probably the last known operator around there. Uh, except for uh, one maybe over Kapunda and uh, another one uh, down the track a bit at Hamley Bridge, but uh, um, they uh, they do an awful lot of uh, awful lot of stuff. Um, the 
um, Horus balloon launches uh, particularly um, sort of uh, cobbled together by uh, very very clue a young lad Mike Jessup uh, 5QI um, although uh, I'm not sure what he's doing these days don't hear much of him his blog hasn't been updated for a while but uh, uh, he is an engineer and uh, I think he's working for some other um, uh, some other company as well um, Grant Willis another um, another lad who's fairly uh, well I've known him since I've had an AM licence he used to be uh, uh, when he was a young 14 year old uh, 5ZWI I can't remember what his uh, uh, oh, yes uh, 5GR yeah that's uh, that's his course on now and uh, uh, he's working in uh, uh, mobile phone engineering uh, I think I think he's still in there so uh, uh, very cluey bunch they're in, in, into everything that uh, that might be going so uh, um, I'm not sure why they chose that location per se but uh, it's, it's certainly in a good place as you know and it's very successful and uh, and you're right about the internet access to um, that is a very important part of the whole scheme whereas the other sites the uh, internet access probably isn't quite as good as it could be um, I'm not quite sure how the mobile services work around there these days I actually didn't take much notice the last time I went through I was more interested in uh, sampling the um, the wares at the local bakery uh, that is a very important thing to do don't worry about this radio stuff. No, no, no. You got to, you got to get into the bakery. That's the way to do it. So uh, um, hopefully get, that gives you a little bit more insight. But uh, if you require any more information, I'll see what I can dig up. It's, uh, yeah, it's been a while, but I don't get over as uh, as often as I used to. Well, I might make this my uh, last round. Uh, better go inside, see what the two furry ferals are doing. Uh, as long as they're not. Um, disturbing the uh, the grandson that's uh, that's uh, very good it will be I haven't heard them making a noise outside either so perhaps they've gone back got bored gone back inside and settled down but uh, yeah thanks for your uh, um, your broadcast tonight um, all your experimental stuff and uh, I'll uh, keep an eyeball across it in the coming weeks I'll bid everybody a good evening and uh, catch you a bit further down the track. The K3 AML Group, the K3 GLC. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it, I'm one of the forthcoming week sessions. I've lined up uh, for a pre-recorded interview. Uh, my old mate from America, from Salt Lake City, Clint Turner, KA7OEI, because Clint uh, has been instrumental with another chap named Gary Crum setting up uh, what's probably one of the best web SDRs in the world in a former HF, pardon me, HF monitoring station run during the days of the Cold War to monitor the Russians and whatnot. In northern Utah, middle of nowhere, they've got a massive log periodic antenna that actually has gain down to 80 metres. Massive thing. Huge mast it's on. And uh, that northern Utah web SDR uh, was partly engineered by uh, Clint Turner, who also did a lot of work on the KPH web SDR at Point Reyes, another old naval station on the coast somewhat to the north of San Francisco, which is also an excellent and sensitive uh, receiver in a very quiet location. So I'd like to talk to him. And if possible, it would be interesting to talk to people who've been involved with the design of really good web SDRs elsewhere, because I think it would make a, a valuable contribution to the Saturday night sessions to get some information on them. They vary so greatly in effectiveness, depending on the person who's set them up. I mean, there's one near me that works through a rubber ducky antenna about six inches long, and it sounds like it. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> Dave 3ASE and Steve 3SL, I suggested 
to them that I should go down there and just suggest that this chap who runs that particular one run an inverted L rather than just the six inch thing. And they both said, no, <laughs> don't do that because we use it to listen to ourselves on 160 metres and we, can, we know that if we can even hear ourselves through the thing, we're putting out a big signal. <laughs> Sometimes um, reasonably deaf receivers can be useful for that reason. Um, so it's uh, on to Michael VK3CMC, who may be there still. Uh, failing that, I'll hand it back to you for a final uh, Dave. VK3CMC, VK3AML. Yes, VK3AML, VK3CMC. And good night, Gary. Gary is my neighbour. We we are only a few hundred metres apart. Our residence. Um, if I was still young, I could probably kick a football from my place over to his place. Not quite. Um, yes, thank you, Chris, for uh, a fascinating night. This is way past my bedtime. I, uh, I'm never up this late. Not even on New Year's Eve do I stay up the midnight. So, But it has been very interesting. Um, well, if you're looking to get out and film us gentlemen doing interesting things portable, there is a YouTube video of me that was put up maybe a couple of months ago, of me uh, uh, talking to a local amateur on 160 metres um, SSB whilst bicycle mobile, Chris. So uh, maybe we can refilm that. And uh, you can sit on the back, the back rack of my bicycle <laughs> and film over my shoulder as I, uh, as I talk on 160 metres uh, bicycle mobile, and that's real bicycle mobile, not stationary with a wire up uh, a tree. Um, so there you go, and um, we can have a bit of fun. Um, I'm sure you don't want to do that. And I, I've seen you working. I just wanted to mention uh, working 160 metres down at the beach, uh, Chris. Uh, QRP by the bay, quite a few years ago. Um, you were set up down there and had a, a wire strung between two squid poles and I was standing there watching you. It was quite fascinating. With that, um, I will go to bed. And, uh, and David, I've ne I don't think I've ever spoken to you before, so I will say hello to you and uh, hopefully to get to have a chat at some stage. Um, I'll be hosting, we have a Sunday soup kitchen net each 8pm on two metres single sideband, a vertically polarised antenna net 8pm tomorrow night and I'm hosting it for the uh, the uh, the yeah <laughs> I'm getting too tired the uh, Easter Sunday edition so I'll be hosting that tomorrow night so I better get some sleep and thank you once again Chris for bringing me in and I'll say good, good evening to all VK3 AML VK3 Charlie Mike Charlie yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for popping up, um, particularly with the pertinent comments on the antenna following our usage of the same. Very, very good. OK, round to Dave uh, for any final comments. Uh, I do want to close it up about half past midnight because I've got to see my wife in hospital tomorrow. It'll be the last time I see her there. She's coming home on Tuesday. So it's quite important that I run through a checklist with her of uh, what she needs at home. She's fairly immobile at the moment. She will be getting more mobile, hopefully, very quickly. Uh, but she's had spinal surgery of a very serious type, and I need to be there, probably um, leaving here about 11.30 a.m. So, round to Dave for the final for this week, and I hope to see you next week. VK3 ECG and the group VK3 AML. Yeah, VK3 AML and the group VK3 ECG. Yes, fine there. And, uh, yes, thank you, Gary, uh, Michael, sorry. Uh, I'll might have a listen sometime for the uh, Soup Kitchen Net. Uh, um, I'm uh, probably uh, going to be have a little bit of a break. I've had a, taken a bit of time off over Easter, which uh, is great. Oh, I've seen of still doing lots of marking and things like that, which I shouldn't have to do, but there we are. Um, uh, it's uh, it, these things are really have no time and work work time allocated to them. You just got to get them done. 
But uh, all the best uh, uh, to Prue. And um, yes, you'll need to get your very detailed instructions, Chris. Very important. And uh, when uh, when uh, Prue gets home, that everything is. Um, Tickety boo is that the expression or something like that everything is ship shape and Bristol fashion and um, and uh, and coming from Bristol I know what that's about, what that's <laughs> like uh, so there we are anyway all the best to her and hopefully um, things uh, will be improving and uh, with the mobility and things like that and I'll have to have a, a bit of a think about uh, the um, uh, resident infid dipoles and things like that because I suspect they would be quite fun to have a go at something like that I like to, to build odd bits and pieces, um, but there we are. Very happy some stage to um, do some more videoing if you if you really want to have a go. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun place to uh, a, a, um, out in the Warrandyte sort of forest areas. It's a, it's a little bit different, um, and uh, but 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 all but but a, but a good fun. And, and in fact, you can get to most places that too much um, um, effort in any event and it's, uh, there is certainly some, some nice scenery. Thank you very much for the very interesting test tonight and um, uh, just seeing things I think helps a great deal when you're, when you're looking at just working out what, what works in construction, what works in setting up stations. You know, you can read all, all about it you like, you can hear all kinds of stuff, but actually seeing it working is, is no doubt the best thing. All very best then. I'll say uh, sympathies to everyone and um, i catch you um, sometime next week. Cheers then. VK3 ECG now from clear with VK3 AML in the group. Good night all. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, it's actually been very interesting to uh, investigate the joining of YouTube live streaming with amateur radio and the possibilities thereof. Uh... I mean, in conjunction with ham radio, uh, you can do things that neither internet nor ham radio can do on their own, but the, you bring them together. And uh, situations like web SDRs have, uh, you know, revolutionised ham radio in many ways, particularly HF. OK, over to the star of the show for the night, VK3ACZ and Sandra. And thanks, Sandra, for her assistance too. It was very nice to have a chat to her about what she does. I'd always wondered, and uh, hearing about the uh, translators that she works with, it's interesting. Um, so I hope that's the first time of many, and at some stage, Peter, I'll have to get uh, Sandra, yourself, Prue and myself together at a hostelry a restaurant, VK, VK3ACZ, to thank you, the VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML in the diminishing group, VK3ACZ. Yeah, that'll be good, Chris. Uh, would look forward to that. So uh, best wishes for Prue. Uh, good night to uh, Dave, Michael, who's probably already gone, uh, Gary and yourself. And uh, thanks again for, for what you do for making your test transmissions every Saturday night so, uh, so interesting and something to look forward to. And uh, if there was one other thing I wanted to say, oh, yeah, it's to Dob Michael in uh, you might be able to get a QRP session with him worth filming too. Uh, Michael and um, uh, his friend Mark, uh, 3MDH, I remember it because he calls him Making Donut Holes. Uh, they go up in the Churchill National Park or Listerfield National Park, whichever it is, with their 817s, and they were the impetus for me uh, getting an 818 because uh, a couple of times playing with their radios and having some good contacts uh, uh, convinced me uh, long before I saw Peter Parker's videos that uh, it was uh, good fun doing QRP. So yeah, there might there might be another video there if you're looking for uh, <laughs> looking for a, for a slightly different angle. And uh, just lastly. Uh, it was a delight for me to see you working that Italian station, Chris. It really, really was um, uh, that I could share the afternoon with you like that uh, was, um, yeah, just a treat. So thank you for that. And uh, uh, I look forward to next week's broadcast, uh, sorry, transmission, <laughs> test transmission already. VK3 AML, 7-3 to all, VK3 ACZ. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And finally, Gary, to tie the ribbons, if you're still there. VK3 GLC, VK3 AML. No, he's gone. OK, this is VK3 AML now closing. Uh, 
our sessage, our commercial message, our missions as 3ASC used to call it, and Tony, 3AML, my predecessor. And uh, we'll catch you next week. VK3 AML Click. And to all the people on stream, um, I've had my hands a bit full with um, um, stuff to be able to reply to all of the written messages. I hope Pirate... There are two Pirates, VK Pirate and Pirate. So... <laughs> um, doesn't copyright last for only 70 years? Well, turns out that uh, copyright can be renewed on certain things by certain companies. And every time, every time um, copyright statute of limitations is set, an organisation like the Disney organisation will frequently extend the copyright because that bloody Mickey Mouse was born in 1929 and Disney's are paranoid that... Mickey Mouse's first cartoons might slip into the public domain. So it was originally 50 years, then it was 70 years, then it's 75. And uh, hello to VK3XBB. It is getting quite late here, um, so I'd better pull the stream, but I see that there are nearly 20 people watching, which is good. Thank you, people. Um, it makes the whole business of running out with the video camera and throwing these things together worthwhile, particularly in one's retirement. Uh, so thank you all very much for being here, and I hope to see you again 9.30pm next Saturday. All being well for the next, uh, I won't say exciting instalment, but perhaps interesting instalment would be accurate. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima now uh, terminating the stream. I hope I can find the right button.